Dracula by Bram Stoker Chapter 19 Jonathan Harker's Journal 1st of October, 5 a.m. I went with the party to the search with an easy mind, for I think I never saw Mina so absolutely strong and well. I'm so glad that she consented to hold back and let us men do the work. Somehow it was a dread to me that she was in this fearful business at all, but now that her work is done, and that it is due to her energy and brains and foresight that the whole story is put together in such a way that every point tells, she may well feel that her part is finished, and she can henceforth leave the rest to us. We were, I think, all a little upset by the scene with Mr. Renfield. When we came away from his room, we were silent till we got back to the study. Then Mr. Morris said to Dr. Seward, "'Say, Jack, if that man wasn't attempting a bluff, he is about the sanest lunatic I ever saw. I am not sure, but I believe he had some serious purpose, and if he had, it was pretty rough on him not to get a chance.' Lord Godalming and I were silent, but Dr. Van Helsing added, "'Friend John, you know more about lunatics than I do, and I am glad of it, for I fear that if it had been me to decide, I would before that last hysterical outburst have given him free. But we live and learn, and in our present task we must take no chance, as my friend Quincy would say. All is best as they are.' Dr. Seward seemed to answer them both in a dreamy kind of way. "'I don't know, but that I agree with you.' If that man had been an ordinary lunatic, I would have taken my chance of trusting him, but he seems so mixed up with the Count in an indexy kind of way that I'm afraid of doing anything wrong by helping his fads. I can't forget how he prayed with almost equal fervour for a cat, then tried to tear my throat out with his teeth. Besides, he called the Count Lord and Master, and he may want to get out and help him in some diabolical way. That horrid thing has the wolves and rats and his own kind to help him, so I suppose he isn't above trying to use a respectable lunatic. He certainly did seem earnest, though. I only hope we have done what is best. These things, in conjunction with the wild work we have in hand, help to unnerve a man. The professor stepped over, and laying his hand on his shoulder, said in his grave, kindly way, "'Friend John, have no fear. We are trying to do our duty in a very sad and terrible case.' We can only do as we deem best. What else have we to hope for, except the pity of the good God? Lord Godalming had slipped away for a few minutes, but now he returned. He held up a little silver whistle, as he remarked. That old place may be full of rats, and if so, I've got an antidote on call. Having passed the wall, we took our way to the house, taking care to keep in the shadows of the trees on the lawn when the moonlight shone out. When we got to the porch, the professor opened his bag, and took out a lot of things which he laid on the step, sorting them into four little groups, evidently one for each. Then he spoke. "'My friends, we are going into a terrible danger, and we need arms of many kinds. Our enemy is not merely spiritual. Remember that he has the strength of twenty men, and that, though our necks or our windpipes are of the common kind, and therefore breakable or crushable, his are not amenable to mere strength.' A stronger man or a body of men, more strong in all than him, can at certain times hold him, but they cannot hurt him as we can be hurt by him. We must therefore guard ourselves from his touch. Keep this near your heart. As he spoke he lifted a small silver crucifix, and held it out to me, I being nearest to him. Put these flowers round your neck. Here he handed me a wreath of withered garlic blossoms. For other enemies more mundane, this revolver and this knife, and for aid in all, these so small electrical lamps, which you can fasten to your breast, and for all, and above all at the last, this, which we must not desecrate needless. This was a portion of sacred wafer, which he put in an envelope and handed to me. Each of the others was similarly equipped. Now, he said, friend John, where are the skeleton keys? If we can open the door... We need not break into the house by the window, as before at Miss Lucy's. Dr. Seward tried one or two skeleton keys, his mechanical dexterity as a surgeon, standing him in good stead. Presently he got one to suit. After a little play back and forward the bolt yielded, and with a rusty clang shot back. We pressed on the door, the rusty hinges creaked, and it slowly opened. It was startling like the image conveyed to me in Dr. Seward's diary of the opening of Miss Westenra's tomb. I fancied that the same idea appeared to strike the others, for with one accord they shrank back. 
the Professor was the first to move forward, and he stepped into the open door. "'In manus tuas, Domine,' he said, crossing himself as we passed over the threshold. We closed the door behind us, lest when we should have lit our lamps we should possibly attract attention from the road. The Professor carefully tried the lock, lest we might not be able to open it from within should we be in a hurry making our exit. Then we all lit our lamps and proceeded on our search. The light from the tiny lamps fell in all sorts of odd forms, as the rays crossed each other, or the opacity of our bodies through great shadows. I could not for my life get away from the feeling that there was someone else amongst us. I suppose it was the recollection so powerfully brought home to me by the grim surroundings of that terrible experience in Transylvania. I think the feeling was common to us all, for I noticed that the others kept looking over their shoulders at every sound and every new shadow, just as I felt myself doing. The whole place was thick with dust. The floor was seemingly inches deep, except where there were recent footsteps, in which on holding down my lamp I could see marks of hobnails where the dust was cracked. The walls were fluffy and heavy with dust, and in the corners were masses of spider's webs, whereon the dust had gathered till they looked like old tattered rags as the weight had torn them partly down. On a table in the hall was a great bunch of keys, with a time-yellowed label on each. They had been used several times, for on the table were several similar rents in the blanket of dust, similar to that exposed when the professor lifted them. He turned to me and said, "'You know this place, Jonathan. You have copied maps of it, and you know it at least more than we do. Which is the way to the chapel?' I had an idea of its direction, though on my former visit I had not been able to get admission to it. So I led the way, and after a few wrong turnings found myself opposite a low, arched oaken door, ribbed with iron bands. "'This is the spot,' said the professor as he turned his lamp on a small map of the house, copied from the file of my original correspondence regarding the purchase. With a little trouble we found the key on the bunch and opened the door. We were prepared for some unpleasantness, for as we were opening the door a faint, malodorous air seemed to exhale through the gaps. But none of us ever expected such an odour as we encountered. None of the others had met the Count at all at close quarters, and when I had seen him he was either in the fasting stage of his existence in his rooms, or when he was bloated with fresh blood, in a ruined building open to the air. But here the place was small and close and the long disuse had made the air stagnant and foul. There was an earthy smell as of some dry miasma which came through the fouler air. But as to the odour itself, how shall I describe it? It was not alone that it was composed of all the ills of mortality, and with the pungent, acrid smell of blood, but it seemed as though corruption had become itself corrupt. Ugh! It sickens me to think of it. Every breath exhaled by that monster seemed to have clung to the place and intensified its loathsomeness. Under ordinary circumstances, such a stench would have brought our enterprise to an end. But this was no ordinary case, and the high and terrible purpose in which we were involved gave us a strength which rose above merely physical considerations. After the involuntary shrinking consequent on the first nauseous whiff, we one and all set about our work as though that loathsome place were a garden of roses. We made an accurate examination of the place, the professor saying as we began, the first thing is to see how many of the boxes are left. We must then examine every hole and corner and cranny, and see if we cannot get some clue as to what has become of the rest. A glance was sufficient to show how many remained, for the great earth chests were bulky and there was no mistaking them. There were only twenty-nine left out of the fifty. Once I got a fright, for, seeing Lord Godalming suddenly turn and look out of the vaulted door into the dark passage beyond, I looked too, and for an instant my heart stood still. Somewhere, looking out from the shadow, I seemed to see the highlights of the Count's evil face, the ridge of the nose, the red eyes, the red lips, the awful pallor. It was only for a moment, for, as Lord Godalming said, I thought I saw a face, but it was only the shadows and resumed his inquiry, I turned my lamp in the direction and stepped into the passage. There was no sign of anyone, and as there were no corners, no doors, no aperture of any kind but only the solid walls of the passage, there could be no hiding place even for him. I took it that fear had helped imagination, and said nothing. 
A few moments later I saw Morris step suddenly back from a corner which he was examining. We all followed his movements with our eyes, for undoubtedly some nervousness was growing on us, and we saw a whole mass of phosphorescence which twinkled like stars. We all instinctively drew back. The whole place was becoming alive with rats. For a moment or two we stood appalled, all save Lord Godalming, who was seemingly prepared for such an emergency. Rushing over to the great iron-bound oaken door which Dr. Seward had described from the outside, and which I had seen myself, he turned the key in the lock, drew the huge bolts, and swung the door open. Then, taking his little silver whistle from his pocket, he blew a low, shrill call. It was answered from behind Dr. Seward's house by the yelping of dogs, and after about a minute three terriers came dashing round the corner of the house. Unconsciously we had all moved towards the door, and as we moved I noticed that the dust had been much disturbed. The boxes which had been taken out had been brought this way. But even in the minute that had elapsed the number of the rats had vastly increased. They seemed to swarm over the place all at once, till the lamplight, shining on their moving dark bodies and glittering baleful eyes, made the place look like a bank of earth set with fireflies. The dogs dashed on, but at the threshold suddenly stopped and snarled, and then, simultaneously lifting their noses, began to howl in most lugubrious fashion. The rats were multiplying in thousands, and we moved out. Lord Godalming lifted one of the dogs, and carrying him in, placed him on the floor. The instant his feet touched the ground he seemed to recover his courage and rushed at his natural enemies. They fled before him so fast that before he had shaken the life out of a score, the other dogs, who had by now been lifted in the same manner, had but small prey ere the whole mass had vanished. With their going it seemed as if some evil presence had departed, for the dogs frisked about and barked merrily as they made sudden darts at their prostrate foes, and turned them over and over and tossed them in the air with vicious shakes. We all seemed to find our spirits rise. Whether it was the purifying of the deadly atmosphere by the opening of the chapel door, or the relief we experienced by finding ourselves in the open, I know not, but most certainly the shadow of dread seemed to slip from us like a robe, and the occasion of our coming lost something of its grim significance, though we did not slacken a whit in our resolution. We closed the outer door and barred and locked it, and bringing the dogs with us began our search of the house. We found nothing throughout except dust in extraordinary proportions, and all untouched save for my own footsteps when I had made my first visit. Never once did the dogs exhibit any symptom of uneasiness, and even when we returned to the chapel they frisked about as though they had been rabbit-hunting in a summer wood. The morning was quickening in the east when we emerged from the front. Dr. Van Helsing had taken the key of the hall door from the bunch, and locked the door in orthodox fashion, putting the key into his pocket when he had done. "'So far,' he said, "'our night has been eminently successful. No harm has come to us such as I feared might be, and yet we have ascertained how many boxes are missing. More than all do I rejoice that this, our first and perhaps our most difficult and dangerous step, has been accomplished, without bringing therein to our most sweet Madam Mina, or troubling her waking or sleeping thoughts with sights and sounds and smells of horror which she might never forget. One lesson, too, we have learned, if it be allowable to argue a particulari, that the brute beasts which are at the Count's command are yet themselves not amenable to his spiritual power. For look, these rats that would come to his call, just as from his castle-top he summoned the wolves to your going, and to that poor mother's cry, though they come to him, they run pell-mell from the so little dogs of my friend Arthur. We have other matters before us, other dangers, other fears, and that monster. He has not used his power over the brute world for the only or the last time to-night. So be it that he has gone elsewhere. Good. It has given us opportunity to cry check in some ways in this check game, which we play for the stake of human souls. Now let us go home. The dawn is close at hand, and we have reason to be content with our first night's work. It may be ordained that we have many nights and days to follow, if full of peril, but we must go on, and from no danger shall we shrink. The house was silent when we got back, save for some poor creature who was screaming away in one of the distant wards, and a low moaning sound from Renfield's room. The poor wretch was doubtless torturing himself after the manner of the insane, with needless thoughts of pain. I came tiptoe into our own room, and found Mina asleep, 
breathing so softly that I had to put my ear down to hear it. She looks paler than usual. I hope the meeting tonight has not upset her. I am truly thankful that she is to be left out of our future work, and even of our deliberations. It is too great a strain for a woman to bear. I did not think so at first, but I know better now. Therefore I am glad that it is settled. There may be things which would frighten her to hear, and yet to conceal them from her might be worse than to tell her if once she suspected that there was any concealment. Henceforth our work is to be a sealed book to her, till at least such time as we can tell her that all is finished, and the earth free from a monster of the netherworld. I dare say it would be difficult to begin to keep silence after such confidence as ours, but I must be resolute, and to-morrow I shall keep dark over to-night's doings, and shall refuse to speak of anything that has happened. I rest on the sofa so as not to disturb her. 1st of October, later. I suppose it was natural that we should all have overslept ourselves, for the day was a busy one, and the night had no rest at all. Even Mina must have felt his exhaustion, for though I slept till the sun was high, I was awake before her, and had to call two or three times before she awoke. Indeed, she was so sound asleep that for a few seconds she did not recognise me, but looked at me with a sort of blank terror, as one looks who has been waked out of a bad dream. She complained a little of being tired, and I let her rest till later in the day. We now know of twenty-one boxes having been removed, and if it be that several were taken in any of these removals, we may be able to trace them all. Such will, of course, immensely simplify our labour, and the sooner the matter is attended to, the better. I shall look up Thomas Snelling to-day. Dr. Seward's Diary 1st of October. It was towards noon when I was awakened by the professor walking into my room. He was more jolly and cheerful than usual, and it is quite evident that last night's work has helped take some of the brooding weight off his mind. After going over the adventure of the night, he suddenly said, "'Your patient interests me much. May it be that with you I visit him this morning? Or if that you are too occupied, I can go alone if it may be. It is a new experience to me to find a lunatic who talks philosophy and reason so sound.' I had some work to do which pressed, so I told him that if he would go alone, I would be glad, as then I should not have to keep him waiting. So I called an attendant and gave him the necessary instructions. Before the professor left the room, I cautioned him against getting any false impression from my patient. But, he answered, I want to talk to him of himself and of his delusion as to consuming live things. He said to Madame Mina, as I see in your diary of yesterday, that he had once had such a belief. Why do you smile, friend John? Excuse me, I said, but the answer is here. I laid my hand on the typewritten matter. When our sane and learned lunatic made that very statement of how he used to consume life, his mouth was actually nauseous with the flies and spiders which he had eaten just before Mrs. Harker entered the room. Van Helsing smiled in turn. Good, he said, your memory is true, friend John. I should have remembered. And yet it is this very obliquity of thought and memory which makes mental disease such a fascinating study. Perhaps I may gain more knowledge out of the folly of this madman than I shall from teaching of the most wise. Who knows? I went on with my work, and before long was through that in hand. It seemed that the time had been very short indeed, but there was Van Helsing back in the study. Do I interrupt? he asked politely as he stood at the door. Not at all, I answered. Come in. My work is finished and I am free. I can go with you now if you like. It is needless. I have seen him. Well? I fear that he does not appraise me at much. Our interview was short. When I entered his room he was sitting on a stool in the centre with his elbows on his knees, and his face was the picture of sullen discontent. I spoke to him as cheerfully as I could, and with such a measure of respect as I could assume. He made no reply whatever. Don't you know me? I asked. His answer was not reassuring. I know you well enough. You are the old fool Van Helsing. I wish you would take yourself and your idiotic brain theories somewhere else. Damn all thick-headed Dutchmen! Not a word more would he say, but sat in his implacable sullenness, as indifferent to me as though I had not been in the room at all. Thus departed for this time, my chance of much learning from this so clever lunatic, so I shall go, if I may, and cheer myself with a few happy words with that sweet soul, Madame Mina. Friend John, it does rejoice me unspeakably that she is no more to be pained, no more to be worried with our terrible things. Though we shall much miss her help, it is better so. 
"'I agree with you with all my heart,' I answered earnestly, for I did not want him to weaken in this matter. "'Mrs. Harker is better out of it. Things are quite bad enough for us, all men of the world, and who have been in many tight places in our time. But it is no place for a woman, and if she had remained in touch with the affair, it would in time infallibly have wrecked her.' So Van Helsing has gone to confer with Mrs. Harker and Harker. Quincy and Art are all out following up the clues as to the earth boxes. I shall finish my round of work, and we shall meet tonight. Mina Harker's Journal 1st of October It is strange to me to be kept in the dark as I am today, after Jonathan's full confidence for so many years, to see him manifestly avoid certain matters, and those are the most vital of all. This morning I slept late after the fatigues of yesterday, and though Jonathan was late too, he was the earlier. He spoke to me before he went out, never more sweetly or tenderly, but he never mentioned a word of what had happened in the visit to the Count's house. And yet he must have known how terribly anxious I was. Poor dear fellow, I suppose it must have distressed him even more than it did me. They all agreed that it was best that I should not be drawn further into this awful work, and I acquiesced. But to think that he keeps anything from me, and now I am crying like a silly fool, when I know it comes from my husband's great love and from the good, good wishes of those other strong men. That has done me good. Well, some day Jonathan will tell me all, and lest it should ever be that he should think for a moment that I kept anything from him, I still keep my journal as usual. Then, if he is feared of my trust, I shall show it to him, with every thought of my heart put down for his dear eyes to read. I feel strangely sad and low-spirited today. I suppose it is the reaction from the terrible excitement. Last night I went to bed when the men had gone, simply because they told me to. I didn't feel sleepy, and I did feel full of devouring anxiety. I kept thinking over everything that has been ever since Jonathan came to see me in London, and it all seems like a horrible tragedy, with fate pressing on relentlessly to some destined end. Everything that one does seems, no matter how right it may be, to bring on the very thing which is most to be deplored. If I hadn't gone to Whitby, perhaps poor dear Lucy would be with us now. She hadn't taken to visiting the churchyard till I came, and if she hadn't come there in the daytime with me she wouldn't have walked in her sleep, and if she hadn't gone there at night and asleep that monster wouldn't have destroyed her as he did. Oh, why did I ever go to Whitby? There now, crying again. I wonder what has come over me today. I must hide it from Jonathan, for if he knew that I had been crying twice in one morning, I, who never cried on my own account, and whom he has never caused to shed a tear, the dear fellow would fret his heart out. I shall put a bold face on, and if I do feel weepy, he shall never see it. I suppose it is just one of the lessons that we poor women have to learn. I can't quite remember how I fell asleep last night. I remember hearing the sudden barking of the dogs, and a lot of queer sounds, like praying on a very tumultuous scale from Mr. Renfield's room, which is somewhere under this. And then there was silence over everything, silence so profound that it startled me, and I got up and looked out of the window. All was dark and silent, the black shadows thrown by the moonlight seeming full of a silent mystery of their own. Not a thing seemed to be stirring, but all to be grim and fixed as death or fate, so that a thin streak of white mist, that crept with almost imperceptible slowness across the grass towards the house, seemed to have a sentience and a vitality of its own. I think that the digression of my thoughts must have done me good, for when I got back to bed I found a lethargy creeping over me. I lay a while, but could not quite sleep, so I got out and looked out of the window again. The mist was spreading, and was now close up to the house, so that I could see it lying thick against the wall, as though it were stealing up to the windows. The poor man was more loud than ever, and though I could not distinguish a word he said, I could in some way recognise in his tones some passionate entreaty on his part. Then there was the sound of a struggle, and I knew that the attendants were dealing with him. I was so frightened that I crept into bed and pulled the clothes over my head, putting my fingers in my ears. I was not then a bit sleepy, at least so I thought, but I must have fallen asleep, for except dreams, I do not remember anything until the morning when Jonathan woke me. I think that it took me an effort and a little time to realise where I was, and that it was Jonathan who was bending over me. My dream was very peculiar, and was almost typical of the way that waking thoughts become merged in or continued in dreams. I thought that I was asleep, and waiting for Jonathan to come back. 
I was very anxious about him, and I was powerless to act. My feet and my hands and my brain were weighted, so that nothing could proceed at the usual pace. And so I slept uneasily and thought. Then it began to dawn upon me that the air was heavy and dank and cold. I put back the clothes from my face and found to my surprise that all was dim around. The gaslight, which I had left lit for Jonathan, but turned down, came only like a tiny red spark through the fog, which had evidently grown thicker and poured into the room. Then it occurred to me that I had shut the window before I had come to bed. I would have got out to make certain on the point, but some leaden lethargy seemed to chain my limbs and even my will. I lay still and endured, that was all. I closed my eyes, but could still see through my eyelids. It is wonderful what tricks our dreams play us, and how conveniently we can imagine. The mist grew thicker and thicker, and I could see now how it came in, for I could see it like smoke, or with the white energy of boiling water, pouring in not through the window, but through the joinings of the door. It got thicker and thicker, till it seemed as if it became concentrated into a sort of pillar of cloud in the room, through the top of which I could see the light of the gas, shining like a red eye. Things began to whirl through my brain, just as the cloudy column was now whirling in the room, and through it all came the scriptural words, a pillar of cloud by day and of fire by night. Was it indeed such spiritual guidance that was coming to me in my sleep? But the pillar was composed of both the day and the night guiding, for the fire was in the red eye, which at the thought got a new fascination for me, till, as I looked, the fire divided, and seemed to shine on me through the fog like two red eyes, such as Lucy told me of in her momentary mental wandering, when, on the cliff, the dying sunlight struck the windows of St. Mary's Church. Suddenly the horror burst upon me that it was thus that Jonathan had seen those awful women growing into reality through the whirling mist in the moonlight, and in my dream I must have fainted, for all became black darkness. The last conscious effort which my imagination made was to show me a livid white face bending over me out of the mist. I must be careful of such dreams, for they would unseat one's reason if there were too much of them. I would get Dr. Van Helsing or Dr. Seward to prescribe something for me which would make me sleep, only that I fear to alarm them. Such a dream at the present time would become woven into their fears for me. Tonight I shall strive hard to sleep naturally. If I do not, I shall tomorrow night get them to give me a dose of chloral that cannot hurt me for once, and it will give me a good night's sleep. Last night tired me more than if I had not slept at all. 2nd of October, 10 p.m. Last night I slept, but did not dream. I must have slept soundly, for I was not waked by Jonathan coming to bed, but the sleep has not refreshed me, for today I feel terribly weak and spiritless. I spent all yesterday trying to read, or lying down dozing. In the afternoon Mr. Renfield asked if he might see me. Poor man, he was very gentle, and when I came away he kissed my hand and bade God bless me. Some way it affected me much. I am crying when I think of him. This is a new weakness of which I must be careful. Jonathan would be miserable if he knew I had been crying. He and the others were out till dinner-time, and they all came in tired. I did what I could to brighten them up, and I supposed that the effort did me good, for I forgot how tired I was. After dinner they sent me to bed, and all went off to smoke together, as they said, but I knew that they wanted to tell each other of what had occurred to each other during the day. I could see from Jonathan's manner that he had something important to communicate. I was not so sleepy as I should have been, so before they went I asked Dr. Seward to give me a little opiate of some kind, as I had not slept well the night before. He very kindly made up a sleeping draught which he gave to me, telling me that it would do me no harm, as it was very mild. I have taken it, and am waiting for sleep, which still keeps aloof. I hope I have not done wrong, for as sleep begins to flirt with me a new fear comes, that I may have been foolish in thus depriving myself of the power of waking. I might want it. Here comes sleep. Good night. CHAPTER Twenty. Jonathan Harker's Journal 1st October Evening. I found Thomas Snelling in his house at Bethnal Green, but unhappily he was not in a condition to remember anything. The very prospect of beer which my expected coming had opened to him had proved too much, 
and he had begun too early on his expected debauch. I learned, however, from his wife, who seemed a decent, poor soul, that he was only the assistant of Smollett, who of the two mates was the responsible person. So off I drove to Woolworth, and found Mr. Joseph Smollett at home, and in his shirt sleeves, taking a late tea out of a saucer. He is a decent, intelligent fellow, distinctly a good, reliable type of workman, and with a headpiece of his own. He remembered all about the incident of the boxes, and from a wonderful dog-eared notebook, which he produced from some mysterious receptacle about the seat of his trousers, and which had hieroglyphical entries in thick, half-obliterated pencil, he gave me the destinations of the boxes. There were, he said, six in the cartload which he took from Carfax and left at 197 Chicksand Street, Mile End New Town, and another six which he deposited at Jamaica Lane, Bermondsey. If, then, the Count meant to scatter these ghastly refuges of his over London, these places were chosen as the first of delivery so that later he might distribute more fully. The systematic manner in which this was done made me think that he could not mean to confine himself to two sides of London. He was now fixed on the far east on the northern shore, on the east of the southern shore, and on the south. The north and west were surely never meant to be left out of his diabolical scheme, let alone the city itself and the very heart of fashionable London in the south-west and west. I went back to Smollett and asked him if he could tell us if any other boxes had been taken from Carfax. He replied, "'Well, Governor, you've treated me very handsome.' I had given him half a sovereign. "'And I'll tell you all I know. I heard a man by the name of Bloxham say four nights ago in the air and ounds, in Pincher's Alley, as how he and his mate had had a rare dusty job in an old house at Purfleet. There ain't a many such jobs as this here.' and I'm thinking that maybe Sam Bloxham could tell you summat. I asked if he could tell me where to find him. I told him that if he could get me the address it would be worth another half-sovereign to him. So he gulped down the rest of his tea and stood up, saying that he was going to begin the search then and there. At the door he stopped and said, "'Look here, Governor, there ain't no sense in me a keeping you here. I may find Sam soon, or I mayn't. But anyhow—' He ain't like to be in a way to tell you much tonight. Sam is a rare one when he starts on the booze. If you can give me an envelope with a stamp on it, and put your address on it, I'll find out where Sam is to be found and post it you tonight. But you'd better be up arter him soon in the morning, never mind the booze the night afore. This was all practical. So one of the children went off with a penny to buy an envelope and a sheet of paper, and to keep the change. When she came back, I addressed the envelope and stamped it, and when Smollett had again faithfully promised to post the address when found, I took my way to home. We're on the track, anyhow. I am tired tonight, and I want to sleep. Mina is fast asleep, and looks a little too pale. Her eyes look as though she had been crying. Poor dear, I've no doubt it frets her to be kept in the dark and it may make her doubly anxious about me and the others. But it is best as it is. It is better to be disappointed and worried in such a way now than to have her nerve broken. The doctors were quite right to insist on her being kept out of this dreadful business. I must be firm, for on me this particular burden of silence must rest. I shall not ever enter on the subject with her under any circumstances. Indeed, it may not be a hard task, after all, for she herself has become reticent on the subject, and has not spoken of the Count or his doings ever since we told her of our decision. 2nd October. Evening. A long and trying and exciting day. By the first post I got my directed envelope with a dirty scrap of paper enclosed, on which was written with a carpenter's pencil in a sprawling hand, Sam Bloxham, Corcoran's, 4 Poters Court, Bartle Street, Walworth. Ask for the Depite. I got the letter in bed, and rose without waking Mina. She looked heavy and sleepy and pale, and far from well. I determined not to wake her, 
but that when I should return from this new search, I would arrange for her going back to Exeter. I think she would be happier in our own home, with her daily tasks to interest her, than in being here amongst us and in ignorance. I only saw Dr. Seward for a moment, and told him where I was off to, promising to come back and tell the rest so soon as I should have found out anything. I drove to Walworth and found, with some difficulty, Potter's Court. Mr. Smollett's spelling misled me, as I asked for Potter's Court instead of Potter's Court. However, when I had found the court, I had no difficulty in discovering Corcoran's lodging house. When I asked the man who came to the door for the depight, he shook his head and said, I don't know him. There ain't no such person here. I never heard of him in all my blooming days. Don't believe there ain't nobody of that kind living here or anywheres. I took out Smollett's letter, and as I read it, it seemed to me that the lesson of the spelling of the name of the court might guide me. What are you? I asked. I'm the deputy, he answered. I saw at once that I was on the right track. Phonetic spelling had again misled me. A half-crown tip put the deputy's knowledge at my disposal, and I learned that Mr. Bloxham, who had slept off the remains of his beer on the previous night at Corcoran's, had left for his work at Poplar at five o'clock that morning. He could not tell me where the place of work was situated, but he had a vague idea that it was some kind of a newfangled werus, and with this slender clue I had to start for Poplar. It was twelve o'clock before I got any satisfactory hint of such a building, and this I got at a coffee shop, where some workmen were having their dinner. One of them suggested that there was being erected at Cross Angel Street a new cold storage building, and as this suited the condition of a new-fangled wearus, I at once drove to it. An interview with a surly gatekeeper and a surlier foreman, both of whom were appeased with the coin of the realm, put me on the track of Bloxham. He was sent for on my suggestion that I was willing to pay his day's wages to his foreman for the privilege of asking him a few questions on a private matter. He was a smart enough fellow, though rough of speech and bearing. When I had promised to pay for his information and given him an earnest, he told me that he had made two journeys between Carfax and a house in Piccadilly, and had taken from this house to the latter nine great boxes, main heavy ones, with a horse and cart hired by him for this purpose. I asked him if he could tell me the number of the house in Piccadilly, to which he replied, "'Well, Governor, I forgets the number, but it was only a few door from a big white church, or something of the kind, not long built. It was a dusty old house, too, though nothing to the dustiness of the house we took the blooming boxes from. How did you get in if both houses were empty?' There was the old party that engaged me a-waiting at the house at Purfleet. He helped me to lift the boxes and put them in the dray. Curse me, but he was the strongest chap I ever struck, and him an old fellow with a white moustache, one that thin you would think he couldn't throw a shadder. How this phrase thrilled through me. Why, he took up his end of the boxes like they was pounds of tea, and me a-puffin' and a-blowin' afore I could upend mine anyhow, and I'm no chicken neither. How did you get into the house in Piccadilly? I asked. He was there too. He must have started off and got there afore me, for when I rung the bell he came and opened the door himself and helped me carry the boxes into the hall. The whole nine? I asked. Yes. There was five in the first load and four in the second. It was main dry work and I don't so well remember how I got home. I interrupted him. Were the boxes left in the hall? Yes, it was a big hall and there was nothing else in it. I made one more attempt to further matters. You didn't have any key? Never used no key nor nothing. The old gent, he opened the door hisself and shut it again when I drove off. I don't remember the last time, but that was the beer. And you can't remember the number of the house? No, sir. But you needn't have no difficulty about that. It's a iron with a stone front with a bow on it, and I steps up to the door. I know them steps, having had to carry the boxes up with three loafers that come round to earn a copper. The old gent give them shillings, and they seeing they got so much, they wanted more. 
but he took one of them by the shoulder and was like to throw him down the steps till the lot of them went away cussing. I thought that with this description I could find the house, so having paid my friend for his information, I started off for Piccadilly. I had gained a new painful experience. The Count could, it was evident, handle the earth boxes himself. If so, time was precious, for now that he had achieved a certain amount of distribution, he could, by choosing his own time, complete the task unobserved. At Piccadilly Circus I discharged my cab and walked westward. Beyond the junior constitutional I came across the house described and was satisfied that this was the next of the lairs arranged by Dracula. The house looked as though it had been long untenanted. The windows were encrusted with dust and the shutters were up. All the framework was black with time, and from the iron the paint had mostly scaled away. It was evident that up to lately there had been a large notice-board in front of the balcony. It had, however, been roughly torn away, the uprights which had supported it still remaining. Behind the rails of the balcony I saw there were some loose boards whose raw edges looked white. I would have given a good deal to have been able to see the notice-board intact, as it would, perhaps, have given some clue to the ownership of the house. I remembered my experience of the investigation and purchase of Carfax, and I could not but feel that if I could find the former owner there might be some means discovered of gaining access to the house. There was at present nothing to be learned from the Piccadilly side, and nothing could be done, so I went around the back to see if anything could be gathered from this quarter. The mews were active, the Piccadilly houses being mostly in occupation. I asked one or two of the grooms and helpers whom I saw around if they could tell me anything about the empty house. One of them said that he heard it had lately been taken, but he couldn't say from whom. He told me, however, that up to very lately there had been a notice-board of For Sale up, and that perhaps Mitchell, Sons and Candy, the house agents, could tell me something, as he thought he remembered seeing the name of that firm on the board. I did not wish to seem too eager or to let my informant know or guess too much. So thanking him in the usual manner, I strolled away. It was now growing dusk, and the autumn night was closing in, so I did not lose any time. Having learned the address of Mitchell, Sons and Candy from a directory at the Barclay, I was soon at their office in Sackville Street. The gentleman who saw me was particularly suave in manner, but uncommunicative in equal proportion. Having once told me that the Piccadilly house, which throughout our interview he called a mansion, was sold, he considered my business as concluded. When I asked who had purchased it, he opened his eyes a thought wider, and paused a few seconds before replying, "'It is sold, sir.' "'Pardon me,' I said, with equal politeness, "'but I have a special reason for wishing to know who purchased it.' Again he paused longer, and raised his eyebrows still more. "'It is sold, sir,' was again his laconic reply. "'Surely,' I said, "'you do not mind letting me know so much.' "'But I do mind,' he answered. "'The affairs of their clients are absolutely safe in the hands of Mitchell, Sons and Candy.' This was manifestly a prig of the first water, and there was no use arguing with him. I thought I had best meet him on his own ground, so I said, "'Your clients, sir, are happy in having so resolute a guardian of their confidence. I am myself a professional man.' Here I handed him my card. In this instance I am not prompted by curiosity. I act on the part of Lord Godalming, who wishes to know something of the property which was, he understood, lately for sale. These words put a different complexion on affairs. He said, "'I would like to oblige you if I could, Mr. Harker, and especially would I like to oblige his lordship. We once carried out a small matter of renting some chambers for him when he was the Honourable Arthur Homewood. If you will let me have his lordship's address, I will consult the house on the subject, and will, in any case, communicate with his lordship by tonight's post. It will be a pleasure if we can so far deviate from our rules as to give the required information to his lordship.' I wanted to secure a friend and not make an enemy, so I thanked him, gave the address at Dr. Seward's, and came away. 
It was now dark, and I was tired and hungry. I got a cup of tea at the aerated bread company and came down to Purfleet by the next train. I found all the others at home. Mina was looking tired and pale, but she made a gallant effort to be bright and cheerful. It wrung my heart to think that I had had to keep anything from her and so caused her inquietude. Thank God this will be the last night of her looking on at our conferences and feeling the sting of our not showing our confidence. It took all my courage to hold to the wise resolution of keeping her out of our grim task. She seems somehow more reconciled, or else the very subject seems to have become repugnant to her, for when any accidental allusion is made, she actually shudders. I am glad we made our resolution in time, as with such a feeling as this, our growing knowledge would be torture to her. I could not tell the others of the day's discovery till we were alone. So after dinner, followed by a little music to save appearances, even amongst ourselves, I took Mina to her room and left her to go to bed. The dear girl was more affectionate with me than ever, and clung to me as though she would detain me. But there was much to be talked of, and I came away. Thank God the ceasing of telling things has made no difference between us. When I came down again, I found the others all gathered round the fire in the study. In the train I had written my diary so far, and simply read it off to them as the best means of letting them get abreast of my own information. When I had finished, Van Helsing said, This has been a great day's work, friend Jonathan. Doubtless we are on the track of the missing boxes. If we find them all in that house, then our work is near the end. But if there be some missing, we must search until we find them. Then shall we make our final coup, and hunt the wretch to his real death. We all sat silent a while, and all at once Mr. Norris spoke. "'Say, how are we going to get into that house?' "'We got into the other,' answered Lord Godalming quickly. "'But, Art, this is different. We broke house at Carfax, but we had night and a walled park to protect us. It will be a mighty different thing to commit burglary in Piccadilly, either by day or night.' I confess I don't see how we are going to get in unless that agency duck can find us a key of some sort. Lord Godalming's brows contracted, and he stood up and walked about the room. By and by he stopped and said, turning from one to another of us, Quincy's head is level. This burglary business is getting serious. We got off once all right, but we have now a rare job on hand, unless we can find the Count's key basket. As nothing could well be done before morning, and as it would be at least advisable to wait till Lord Godalming should hear from Mitchells, we decided not to take any active step before breakfast time. For a good while we sat and smoked, discussing the matter in its various lights and bearings. I took the opportunity of bringing this diary right up to the moment. I am very sleepy and shall go to bed. Just a line. Mina sleeps soundly and her breathing is regular. Her forehead is puckered up into little wrinkles, as though she thinks even in her sleep. She is still too pale, but does not look so haggard as she did this morning. Tomorrow will, I hope, mend all this. She will be herself at home in Exeter. Oh, but I am sleepy. Dr. Seward's Diary 1st October I am puzzled afresh about Renfield. His moods change so rapidly that I find it difficult to keep touch of them, and as they always mean something more than his own well-being, they form a more than interesting study. This morning, when I went to see him after his repulse of Van Helsing, his manner was that of a man commanding destiny. He was, in fact, commanding destiny, subjectively. He did not really care for any of the things of mere earth— he was in the clouds and looked down on all the weaknesses and wants of us poor mortals. I thought I would improve the occasion and learn something, so I asked him, What about the flies these times? He smiled on me in quite a superior sort of way, such a smile as would have become the face of Malvolio, as he answered me. The fly, my dear sir, has one striking feature. Its wings are typical of the aerial powers of the psychic faculties. The ancients did well when they typified the soul as a butterfly. I thought I would push his analogy to its utmost logically. 
So I said quickly, Oh, it is a soul you are after now, is it? His madness foiled his reason, and a puzzled look spread over his face as, shaking his head with a decision which I had but seldom seen in him, he said, Oh, no, oh, no, I want no souls. Life is all I want. Here he brightened up. I am pretty indifferent about it at present. Life is all right. I have all I want. You must get a new patient, doctor, if you wish to study zoophagy. This puzzled me a little, so I drew him on. Then you command life. You are a god, I suppose. He smiled with an ineffably benign superiority. Oh, no! Far be it from me to arrogate to myself the attributes of the deity. I am not even concerned in his especially spiritual doings. If I may state my intellectual position, I am, so far as concerns things purely terrestrial, somewhat in the position which Enoch occupied spiritually. This was a poser to me. I could not at the moment recall Enoch's appositeness, so I had to ask a simple question, though I felt that by so doing I was lowering myself in the eyes of the lunatic. And why with Enoch? Because he walked with God. I could not see the analogy, but did not like to admit it, so I harked back to what he had denied. So you don't care about life, and you don't want souls. Why not? I put my question quickly and somewhat sternly, on purpose to disconcert him. The effort succeeded. For an instant he unconsciously relapsed into his old servile manner, bent low before me, and actually fawned upon me as he replied, I don't want any souls, indeed, indeed, I don't. I couldn't use them if I had them. They would be no manner of use to me. I couldn't eat them, or... He suddenly stopped, and the old cunning look spread over his face, like a wind sweep on the surface of the water. And, Doctor, as to life, what is it, after all, when you've got all you require? And you know that you will never want, that is all. I have friends, good friends, like you, Dr. Seward. This was said with a leer of inexpressible cunning. I know that I shall never lack the means of life. I think that through the cloudiness of his insanity he saw some antagonism in me, for he at once fell back on the last refuge of such as he, a dogged silence. After a short time I saw that for the present it was useless to speak to him. He was sulky, and so I came away. Later in the day he sent for me. Ordinarily I would not have come without special reason. But just at present I am so interested in him that I would gladly make an effort. Besides, I am glad to have anything to help pass the time. Harker is out, following up clues, and so are Lord Godalming and Quincy. Van Helsing sits in my study, poring over the record prepared by the Harkers. He seems to think that by accurate knowledge of all details he will light upon some clue. He does not wish to be disturbed in the work without cause. I would have taken him with me to see the patient, only I thought that after his last repulse he might not care to go again. There was also another reason. Renfield might not speak so freely before a third person as when he and I were alone. I found him sitting in the middle of the floor on his stool, a pose which is generally indicative of some mental energy on his part. When I came in, he said at once, as though the question had been waiting on his lips, "'What about souls?' It was evident, then, that my surmise had been correct. Unconscious cerebration was doing its work, even with the lunatic. I determined to have the matter out. "'What about them yourself?' I asked. He did not reply for a moment, but looked all around him, and up and down, as though he expected to find some inspiration for an answer. "'I don't want any souls,' he said in a feeble, apologetic way. The matter seemed preying on his mind, and so I determined to use it, to be cruel only to be kind. So I said, "'You like life, and you want life?' "'Oh, yes, but that is all right. You needn't worry about that. But,' I asked, "'how are we to get the life without getting the soul also?' This seemed to puzzle him, so I followed it up. A nice time you'll have some time when you're flying out there, with the souls of thousands of flies and spiders and birds and cats buzzing and twittering and moaning all around you. You've got their lives, you know, 
and you must put up with their souls. Something seemed to affect his imagination, for he put his fingers to his ears and shut his eyes, screwing them up tightly just as a small boy does when his face is being soaped. There was something pathetic in it that touched me. It also gave me a lesson, for it seemed that before me was a child, only a child, though the features were worn and the stubble on the jaws was white. It was evident that he was undergoing some process of mental disturbance, and knowing how his past moods had interpreted things seemingly foreign to himself, I thought I would enter into his mind as well as I could and go with him. The first step was to restore confidence, so I asked him, speaking pretty loud so that he would hear me through his closed ears, "'Would you like some sugar to get your flies around again?' He seemed to wake up all at once and shook his head. With a laugh he replied, "'Not much. Flies are poor things, after all.' After a pause he added, "'But I don't want their souls buzzing round me, all the same. "'Or spiders,' I went on. "'Blow spiders. What's the use of spiders? "'There isn't anything in them to eat, or—' He stopped suddenly, as though reminded of a forbidden topic. So, so, I thought to myself, this is the second time he has suddenly stopped at the word drink. What does it mean? Renfield seemed himself aware of having made a lapse, for he hurried on, as though to distract my attention from it. I don't take any stock at all in such matters. Rats and mice and such small deer, as Shakespeare has it. Chicken feed of the larder, they might be called. I'm past all that sort of nonsense. You might as well ask a man to eat molecules with a pair of chopsticks as to try to interest me about the less carnivora, when I know of what is before me. I see, I said. You want big things that you can make your teeth meet in. How would you like to breakfast on an elephant? What ridiculous nonsense you are talking! He was getting too wide awake, so I thought I would press him hard. I wonder, I said reflectively, what an elephant's soul is like. The effect I desired was obtained, for he at once fell from his high horse and became a child again. "'I don't want an elephant's soul, or any soul at all,' he said. For a few moments he sat despondently. Suddenly he jumped to his feet, with his eyes blazing and all the signs of intense cerebral excitement. "'To hell with you and your souls!' he shouted. "'Why do you plague me about souls? Haven't I got enough to worry and pain to distract me already without thinking of souls?' He looked so hostile that I thought he was in for another homicidal fit, so I blew my whistle. The instant, however, that I did so, he became calm, and said apologetically, "'Forgive me, doctor, I forgot myself. You do not need any help. I am so worried in my mind that I am apt to be irritable. If you only knew the problem I have to face, and that I am working out, you would pity and tolerate and pardon me. Pray do not put me in a straight waistcoat.' I want to think, and I cannot think freely when my body is confined. I am sure you will understand. He had evidently self-control, so when the attendants came I told them not to mind, and they withdrew. Renfield watched them go. When the door was closed he said with considerable dignity and sweetness, Dr. Seward, you have been very considerate towards me. Believe me that I am very, very grateful to you. I thought it well to leave him in this mood, and so I came away. There is certainly something to ponder over in this man's state. Several points seem to make what the American interviewer calls a story, if one could only get them in proper order. Here they are. Will not mention drinking. Fears the thought of being burdened with the soul of anything. Has no dread of wanting life in the future despises the meaner forms of life altogether, though he dreads being haunted by their souls. Logically all these things point one way. He has assurance of some kind that he will acquire some higher life. He dreads the consequence, the burden of a soul. Then it is a human life he looks to. And the assurance? Merciful God, the Count has been to him, and there is some new scheme of terror afoot. Later, I went after my round to Van Helsing and told him of my suspicion. He grew very grave, and after thinking the matter over for a while he asked me to take him to Renfield. I did so, 
As we came to the door, we heard the lunatic within singing gaily, as he used to do in the time which now seems so long ago. When we entered, we saw with amazement that he had spread out his sugar as of old. The flies, lethargic with the autumn, were beginning to buzz into the room. We tried to make him talk of the subject of our previous conversation, but he would not attend. He went on with his singing, just as though we had not been present. He had got a scrap of paper and was folding it into a notebook. We had to come away as ignorant as we went in. His is a curious case indeed. We must watch him tonight. Letter Mitchell, Sons and Candy to Lord Godalming 1st October My Lord, We are at all times only too happy to meet your wishes. We beg, with regard to the desire of your lordship, expressed by Mr. Harker on your behalf, to supply the following information concerning the sale and purchase of number 347 Piccadilly. The original vendors are the executors of the late Mr. Archibald Winter Suffield. The purchaser is a foreign nobleman, Count de Ville, who effected the purchase himself, paying the purchase money in notes over the counter, if your lordship will pardon us using so vulgar an expression. Beyond this we know nothing whatever of him. We are, my lord, your lordship's humble servants, Mitchell, Sons and Candy. Dr. Seward's Diary, 2nd October I placed a man in the corridor last night, and told him to make an accurate note of any sound he might hear from Renfield's room, and gave him instructions that if there should be anything strange, he was to call me. After dinner, when we had all gathered round the fire in the study, Mrs. Harker having gone to bed, we discussed the attempts and discoveries of the day. Harker was the only one who had any result— and we are in great hopes that his clue may be an important one. Before going to bed I went round to the patient's room and looked in through the observation trap. He was sleeping soundly. His heart rose and fell with regular respiration. This morning the man on duty reported to me that a little after midnight he was restless and kept saying his prayers somewhat loudly. I asked him if that was all. He replied that it was all he heard. There was something about his manner so suspicious that I asked him point-blank if he had been asleep. He denied sleep, but admitted to having dozed for a while. It is too bad that men cannot be trusted unless they are watched. Today Harker is out following up his clue, and Art and Quincy are looking after horses. Godalming thinks that it would be well to have horses always in readiness, for when we get the information which we seek there will be no time to lose. We must sterilise all the imported earth between sunrise and sunset. We shall thus catch the Count at his weakest, and without a refuge to fly to. Van Helsing is off to the British Museum, looking up some authorities on ancient medicine. The old physicians took account of things which their followers do not accept, and the Professor is searching for witch and demon cures which may be useful to us later. I sometimes think we must be all mad, and that we shall wake to sanity in straight waistcoats. Later. We have met again. We seem at last to be on the track, and our work of tomorrow may be the beginning of the end. I wonder if Renfield's quiet has anything to do with this. His moods have so followed the doings of the Count that the coming destruction of the monster may be carried to him some subtle way. If we could only get some hint as to what passed in his mind between the time of my argument with him today and his resumption of fly-catching— it might afford us a valuable clue. He is now seemingly quiet for a spell. Is he? That wild yell seemed to come from his room. The attendant came bursting into my room and told me that Renfield had somehow met with some accident. He had heard him yell, and when he went to him, found him lying on his face on the floor, all covered with blood. I must go at once. Chapter 21 Dr. Seward's Diary, the 3rd of October Let me put down with exactness all that happened, as well as I can remember, since last I made an entry. Not a detail that I can recall must be forgotten. In all calmness I must proceed. 
When I came to Renfield's room, I found him lying on the floor on his left side in a glittering pool of blood. When I went to move him, it became at once apparent that he had received some terrible injuries. There seemed none of the unity of purpose between the parts of the body which marks even lethargic sanity. As the face was exposed, I could see that it was horribly bruised, as though it had been beaten against the floor. Indeed, it was from the face wounds that the pool of blood originated. The attendant who was kneeling beside the body said to me as we turned him over, "'I think, sir, his back is broken. See, both his right arm and leg and the whole side of his face are paralyzed.' How such a thing could have happened puzzled the attendant beyond measure. He seemed quite bewildered, and his brows were gathered in as he said, "'I can't understand the two things. He could mark his face like that by beating his own head on the floor. I saw a young woman do it once at the Eversfield Asylum before anyone could lay hands on her. And I suppose he might have broken his neck by falling out of bed if he got in an awkward kink. But for the life of me I can't imagine how the two things occurred.' If his back was broke, he couldn't beat his head, and if his face was like that before the fall out of bed, there would be marks on it. I said to him, Go to Dr. Van Helsing, and ask him to kindly come here at once. I want him without an instant's delay. The man ran off, and within a few minutes the professor, in his dressing gown and slippers, appeared. When he saw Renfield on the ground, he looked keenly at him a moment, then turned to me. I think he recognized my thought in my eyes, for he said very quietly, manifestly for the ears of the attendant. Ah, a sad accident. He will need very careful watching and much attention. I shall stay with you myself, but I shall first dress myself. If you will remain, I shall in a few minutes join you. The patient was now breathing stertorously, and it was easy to see that he had suffered some terrible injury. Van Helsing returned with extraordinary celerity, bearing with him a surgical case. He had evidently been thinking, and had his mind made up, for almost before he looked at the patient, he whispered to me, "'Send the attendant away. We must be alone with him when he becomes conscious after the operation.' I said, "'I think that will do now, Simmons. We have done all that we can at present. You had better go your round, and Dr. Van Helsing will operate. Let me know instantly if there be anything unusual anywhere.' The man withdrew, and we went into a strict examination of the patient." The wounds of the face were superficial. The real injury was a depressed fracture of the skull, extending right up through the motor area. The professor thought a moment and said, We must reduce the pressure and get back to normal conditions as far as can be. The rapidity of the suffusion shows the terrible nature of his injury. The whole motor area seems affected. The suffusion of the brain will increase quickly, so he must threaten at once or it may be too late. As he was speaking, there was a soft tapping at the door. I went over and opened it, and found in the corridor without Arthur and Quincy in pajamas and slippers. The former spoke. I heard your man call up Dr. Van Helsing and tell him of an accident. So I woke Quincy, or rather called for him, as he was not asleep. Things are moving too quickly and too strangely for sound sleep for any of us these times. I have been thinking that tomorrow night we'll not see things as they have been. We'll have to look back and forward a little more than we have done. May we come in? I nodded, and held the door open till they had entered, then I closed it again. When Quincy saw the attitude and state of the patient, and noted the horrible pool on the floor, he said softly, My God, what has happened to him? Poor, poor devil. I told him briefly, and added that we expected he would recover consciousness after the operation, for a short time at all events. He went at once and sat down on the edge of the bed, with Godalming beside him, We all watched in patience. "'We shall wait,' said Van Helsing, "'just long enough to fix the best spot for threatening, "'so that we may most quickly and perfectly remove the blood clot, "'for it is evident that the hemorrhage is increasing.' The minutes during which we waited passed with fearful slowness. I had a horrible sinking in my heart, and from Van Helsing's face I gathered that he felt some fear or apprehension as to what was to come. I dreaded the words Renfield might speak. I was positively afraid to think.' but the conviction of what was coming was on me, as I have read of men who have heard the death watch. The poor man's breathing came in uncertain gasps. Each instant he seemed as though he would open his eyes and speak, but then would follow a prolonged stertorous breath, and he would relapse into a more fixed insensibility. Inured as I was to sick beds and death, the suspense grew and grew upon me. I could almost hear the beating of my own heart, and the blood surging through my temples sounded like blows from a hammer. 
The silence finally became agonizing. I looked at my companions, one after another, and saw from their flushed faces and damp brows that they were enduring equal torture. There was a nervous suspense over us all, as though overhead some dread bell would peal out powerfully when we should least expect it. At last there came a time when it was evident that the patient was sinking fast. He might die at any moment. I looked up at the professor and caught his eyes fixed on mine. His face was sternly set as he spoke. That is no time to lose. His words may be worth many lives. I have been thinking so as I stood here. It may be there is a soul at stake. We shall operate just above the ear. Without another word he made the operation. For a few moments the breathing continued to be stertorous. Then there came a breath so prolonged that it seemed as though it would tear open his chest. Suddenly his eyes opened and became fixed in a wild, helpless stare. This was continued for a few moments, then it was softened into a glad surprise, and from his lips came a sigh of relief. He moved convulsively, and as he did so, said, "'I'll be quiet, doctor. Tell them to take off the straight waistcoat. I have had a terrible dream, and it has left me so weak that I cannot move. What's wrong with my face? It feels all swollen, and it smarts dreadfully.' He tried to turn his head, but even with the effort his eyes seemed to grow glassy again, so I gently put it back. Then Van Helsing said in a quiet, grave voice, "'Tell us your dream, Mr. Renfield.' As he heard the voice, his face brightened through its mutilation, and he said, "'That is Dr. Van Helsing. How good it is of you to be here. Give me some water. My lips are dry, and I shall try to tell you. I dreamed—' He stopped and seemed fainting. I called quietly to Quincy. The brandy! It is in my study! Quick! He flew and returned with a glass, the decanter of brandy, and a carafe of water. We moistened the parched lips, and the patient quickly revived. It seemed, however, that his poor injured brain had been working in the interval, for when he was quite conscious, he looked at me piercingly with an agonized confusion which I shall never forget, and said, I must not deceive myself. It was no dream, but all a grim reality. Then his eyes roved around the room. As they caught sight of the two figures sitting patiently on the edge of the bed, he went on, "'If I were not sure already, I would know from them.' For an instant his eyes closed, not with pain or sleep, but voluntarily, as though he were bringing all his faculties to bear. When he opened them, he said hurriedly, and with more energy than he had yet displayed, "'Quick, doctor, quick! I am dying! I feel that I have but a few minutes, and then I must go back to death, or, or worse.' Wet my lips with brandy again. I have something that I must say before I die, or before my crushed brain dies anyhow. Thank you. It was that night after you left me, when I implored you to let me go away. I couldn't speak then, for I felt my tongue was tied. But I was as sane then, except in that way, as I am now. I was in an agony of despair for a long time after you left me. It seemed hours. Th then there came a sudden peace to me. My brain seemed to become cool again, and I realized where I was. I heard the dogs bark behind our house, but not where he was. As he spoke, Van Helsing's eyes never blinked, but his hand came out and met mine and gripped it hard. He did not, however, betray himself. He nodded slightly and said, Go on, in a low voice. Renfield proceeded. He came up to the window in the mist, as I had seen him often before, but he was solid then, not a ghost, and his eyes were fierce like a man's when angry. He was laughing with his red mouth. The sharp white teeth glinted in the moonlight when he turned to look back over the belt of trees to where the dogs were barking. I wouldn't ask him to come in at first, though I knew he wanted to, just as he had wanted all along. Then he began promising me things, not in words, but by doing them. He was interrupted by a word from the professor. How? By making them happen, just as he used to send in the flies when the sun was shining great big fat ones with steel and sapphire on their wings, and big moths in the night with skull and crossbones on their backs. Van Helsing nodded to him, and he whispered to me unconsciously, The Acherantia Atropos of the Sphinges, what you call the death's head moth. The patient went on without stopping. Then he began to whisper, Rats, 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 hundreds, thousands, millions of them, and every one a life, and dogs to eat them, and cats too, all lives, all red blood, with years of life in it, and not merely buzzing flies. I laughed at him, for I wanted to see what he could do. Then the dogs howled, away beyond the dark trees, in his house. 
he beckoned me to the window. I got up and looked out, and he raised his hands, and seemed to call out without using any words. A dark mass spread over the grass, coming on like the shape of a flame of fire. And then he moved the mist to the right and left, and I could see that there were thousands of rats, with their eyes blazing red, like his, only smaller. He held up his hand, and they all stopped, and I thought he seemed to be saying, all these lies will I give you. I am many more and greater through countless ages if you will fall down and worship me. And then a red cloud, like the color of blood, seemed to close over my eyes, and before I knew what I was doing, I found myself opening the sash and saying to him, Come in, Lord and Master. The rats were all gone, but he slid into the room through the sash, though it was only open an inch wide, just as the moon herself has often come in through the tiniest crack and has stood before me in all her size and splendor. His voice was weaker, so I moistened his lips with the brandy again, and he continued, but it seemed as though his memory had gone on working in the interval, for his story was further advanced. I was about to call him back to the point, but Van Helsing whispered to me, Let him go on. Do not interrupt him. He cannot go back, and maybe he could not proceed at all if at once he lost the thread of his thought. He proceeded. All day I waited to hear from him, but he did not send me anything, not even a blow-fly, and when the moon got up I was pretty angry with him. When he did slide in through the window, though it was shut, and did not even knock, I got mad with him. He sneered at me, and his white face looked out of the mist with his red eyes gleaming, and he went on as though he owned the whole place, and I was no one. He didn't even smell the same as he went by me. I couldn't hold him. I thought that somehow Mrs. Harker had come into the room. The two men sitting on the bed stood up and came over, standing behind him so that he could not see them, but where they could hear better. They were both silent, but the professor started and quivered. His face, however, grew grimmer and sterner still. Renfield went on without noticing. When Mrs. Harker came in to see me this afternoon, she wasn't the same. It was like tea, after the teapot has been watered. Here we all moved, but no one said a word. He went on. I didn't know that she was here till she spoke, and she didn't look the same. I don't care for the pale people. I like them with lots of blood in them, and hers all seemed to have run out. I didn't think of it at the time, but when she went away I began to think, and it made me mad to know that he had been taking the life out of her. I could feel that the rest quivered, as I did, but we remained otherwise still. So when he came tonight I was ready for him. I saw the mist stealing in, and I grabbed it tight. I had heard that madmen have unnatural strength, and as I knew I was a madman, at times anyhow, I resolved to use my power. Aye, and he felt it too, for he had to come out of the mist to struggle with me. I held tight, and I thought I was going to win, for I didn't mean him to take any more of her life till I saw his eyes. They burned into me, and my strength became like water. He slipped through it, and when I tried to cling to him, he raised me up and flung me down. There was a red cloud before me, and a noise like thunder, and the mist seemed to steal away under the door. His voice was becoming fainter, and his breath more stertorous. Van Helsing stood up instinctively. "'We know the worst now,' he said. "'He is here, and we know his purpose. It may not be too late. Let us be armed, the same as we were the other night, but lose no time. There is not an instant to spare.' There was no need to put our fear, nay our conviction, into words. We shared them in common. We all hurried and took from our rooms the same things that we had when we entered the Count's house. The professor had his ready, and as we met in the corridor he pointed to them significantly as he said, They never leave me, and they shall not till this unhappy business is over. Be wise also, my friends. It is no common enemy that we deal with, alas, alas, that the Mina should suffer. He stopped, his voice was breaking, and I do not know if rage or terror predominated in my own heart. Outside the Harker's door we paused. Art and Quincy held back, and the latter said, "'Should we disturb her?' "'We must,' said Van Helsing grimly. "'If the door be locked, I shall break it in.' "'May it not frighten her terribly? It is unusual to break into a lady's room.' Van Helsing said solemnly, "'You are always right, but this is life and death.' All chambers are alike to the doctor, and even were they not, they are all as one to me to-night. Friend John, when I turn the handle, if the door does not open, do you put your shoulder down and shove, and you through, my friends. Now! He turned the handle as he spoke, but the door did not yield. We threw ourselves against it. With a crash it burst open, and we almost fell headlong into the room. 
The professor did actually fall, and I saw across him as he gathered himself up from hands and knees. What I saw appalled me. I felt my hair rise like bristles on the back of my neck, and my heart seemed to stand still. The moonlight was so bright that through the thick yellow blind the room was light enough to see. On the bed beside the window lay Jonathan Harker, his face flushed and breathing heavily as though in a stupor. Kneeling on the near edge of the bed, facing outwards, was the white-clad figure of his wife. By her stood a tall, thin man, clad in black. His face was turned from us, but the instant we saw, we all recognized the Count, in every way, even to the scar on his forehead. With his left hand he held both Mrs. Harker's hands, keeping them away with her arms at full tension. His right hand gripped her by the back of the neck, forcing her face down on his bosom. Her white nightdress was smeared with blood, and a thin stream trickled down the man's bare chest which was shown by his torn open dress. The attitude of the two had a terrible resemblance to a child forcing a kitten's nose into a saucer of milk to compel it to drink. As we burst into the room, the Count turned his face, and the hellish look that I had heard described seemed to leap into it. His eyes flamed red with devilish passion. The great nostrils of the white aquiline nose opened wide and quivered at the edge, and the white sharp teeth behind the full lips of the blood-dripping mouth clamped together like those of a wild beast. With a wrench which threw his victim back upon the bed as though hurled from a height, he turned and sprang at us. But by this time the professor had gained his feet, and was holding toward him the envelope which contained the sacred wafer. The Count suddenly stopped, just as poor Lucy had done outside the tomb, and cowered back. Further and further back he cowered, as we, lifting our crucifixes, advanced. The moonlight suddenly failed, as a great black cloud sailed across the sky, and when the gaslight sprang up under Quincy's match, we saw nothing but a faint vapor. This, as we looked, trailed under the door, which with the recoil from its bursting open had swung back to its old position. Van Helsing, Art, and I moved forward to Mrs. Harker, who by this time had drawn her breath, and with it had given a scream so wild, so ear-piercing, so despairing, that it seems to me now that it will ring in my ears till my dying day. For a few seconds she lay in her helpless attitude in disarray. Her face was ghastly, with a pallor which was accentuated by the blood which smeared her lips and cheeks and chin. From her throat trickled a thin stream of blood. Her eyes were mad with terror. Then she put before her face her poor crushed hands, which bore on their whiteness the red mark of the Count's terrible grip, and from behind them came a low, desolate wail which made the terrible scream seem only the quick expression of an endless grief. Van Helsing stepped forward and drew the coverlet gently over her body, whilst Art, after looking at her face for an instant despairingly, ran out of the room. Van Helsing whispered to me, "'Jonathan is in a stupor such as we know the vampire can produce.' We can do nothing with poor Madame Mina for a few moments till she recovers herself. I must wake him. He dipped the end of a towel in cold water, and with it began to flick him on the face, his wife all the while holding her face between her hands and sobbing in a way that was heartbreaking to hear. I raised the blind and looked out of the window. There was much moonshine, and as I looked I could see Quincy Morris run across the lawn and hide himself in the shadow of a great yew tree. It puzzled me to think why he was doing this. But, at the instant, I heard Harker's quick exclamation as he woke to partial consciousness and turned to the bed. On his face, as there might well be, was a look of wild amazement. He seemed dazed for a few seconds, and then full consciousness seemed to burst upon him all at once, and he started up. His wife was aroused by the quick movement, and turned to him with her arms stretched out as though to embrace him. Instantly, however, she drew them in again, and putting her elbows together, held her hands before her face, and shuddered till the bed beneath her shook. "'In God's name, what does this mean?' Harker cried out. "'Dr. Seward! Dr. Van Helsing! What is it? What has happened? What is wrong? Mina, dear, what is it? And what does that blood mean? My God, my God, has it come to this?' And raising himself to his knees, he beat his hands wildly together. "'Good God, help us! Help her!' Oh, help her! With a quick movement he jumped from the bed, and began to pull on his clothes, all the man in him awake at the need for instant exertion. What has happened? Tell me all about it, he cried without pausing. Dr. Van Helsing, you love Mina, I know. Oh, do something to save her. It cannot have gone too far yet. Guard her while I look for him. His wife, through her terror and horror and distress, saw some sure danger to him. Instantly forgetting her own grief, she seized hold of him and cried out, "'No, no, Jonathan, you must not leave me! 
I have suffered enough tonight, God knows, without the dread of his harming you. You must stay with me. Stay with these friends who will watch over you. Her expression became frantic as she spoke, and he, yielding to her, she pulled him down, sitting on the bedside, and clung to him fiercely. Van Helsing and I tried to calm them both. The professor held up his golden crucifix and said with wonderful calmness, Do not fear, my dear. We are here, and whilst this is close to you, no foul thing can approach. You are safe for tonight, and we must be calm and take counsel together. She shuddered and was silent, holding down her head on her husband's breast. When she raised it, his white night robe was stained with blood where her lips had touched, and where the thin open wound in the neck had sent forth drops. The instant she saw it, she drew back with a low wail and whispered amid choking sobs, "'Unclean! Unclean! I must touch him or kiss him no more! Oh, that it should be that it is I who am now his worst enemy, and whom he may have most cause to fear!' To this he spoke out resolutely, "'Nonsense, Mina! It is a shame to me to hear such a word. I would not hear it of you, and I shall not hear it from you. May God judge me by my deserts, and punish me with more bitter suffering than even this hour, if by any act or will of mine anything ever come between us!' He put out his arms and folded her to his breast, and for a while she lay there sobbing. He looked at us over her bowed head, with eyes that blinked damply above his quivering nostrils. His mouth was set as steel. After a while her sobs became less frequent and more faint, and then he said to me, speaking with a studied calmness which I felt tried his nervous power to the utmost, "'And now, Dr. Seward, tell me all about it. Too well I know the broad fact. Tell me all that has been.' I told him exactly what had happened, and he listened with seeming impassiveness, but his nostrils twitched and his eyes blazed as I told how the ruthless hands of the Count had held his wife in that terrible and horrid position with her mouth to the open wound in his breast. It interested me, even at that moment, to see that whilst the face of white set passion worked convulsively over the bowed head, the hands tenderly and lovingly stroked the ruffled hair. Just as I had finished, Quincy and Godalming knocked at the door. They entered in obedience to our summons. Van Helsing looked at me questioningly. I understood him to mean, if we were to take advantage of their coming, to divert, if possible, the thoughts of the unhappy husband and wife from each other and from themselves. So, on nodding acquiescence to him, he asked them what they had seen or done, to which Lord Godalming answered. I could not see him anywhere in the passage or in any of our rooms. I looked in the study, but, though he had been there, he had gone. He had, however— he stopped suddenly, looking at the poor drooping figure on the bed. Van Helsing said gravely, "'Go on, friend Arthur. We want here no more concealments. Our hope now is in knowing all. Tell freely.' So Art went on. He had been there, and though it could only have been for a few seconds, he had made rare hay of the place. All the manuscript had been burned, and the blue flames were flickering among the white ashes. The cylinders of your phonograph, too, were thrown on the fire, and the wax had helped the flames. Here I interrupted. "'Thank God there is another copy in the safe.' His face lit for a moment, but fell again as he went on. I ran downstairs, then, but could see no sign of him. I looked into Renfield's room, but there was no trace there except—' Again he paused. "'Go on,' said Harker hoarsely. So he bowed his head, and moistening his lips with his tongue, added, "'Except that the poor fellow is dead.' Mrs. Harker raised her head. Looking from one to the other of us, she said solemnly, "'God's will be done.' I could not but feel that Art was keeping back something, but as I took it that it was with a purpose, I said nothing. Van Helsing turned to Morris and asked, "'And you, friend Quincy, have you any to tell?' "'A little,' he answered. "'It may be much eventually, but at present I can't say. I thought it well to know, if possible, where the Count would go when he left the house. I did not see him, but I saw a bat rise from Renfield's window and flap westward.' I expected to see him in some shape go back to Carfax, but he evidently sought some other lair. He will not be back tonight, for the sky is reddening in the east, and the dawn is close. We must work tomorrow, he said the latter words through his shut teeth. For a space of perhaps a couple of minutes there was silence, and I could fancy that I could hear the sound of our hearts beating. Then Van Helsing said, placing his hand tenderly on Mrs. Harker's head, "'And now, Madame Mina, poor dear, dead Madame Mina,' Tell us exactly what happened. God knows that I do not want that you be pained, but it is need that we know all. For now more than ever has all work to be done quick and sharp and in deadly earnest. 
The day is close to us that must end all, if it may be so, and now is the chance that we may live and learn. The poor dear lady shivered, and I could see the tension of her nerves as she clasped her husband closer to her and bent her head lower and lower still on his breast. Then she raised her head proudly, and held out one hand to Van Helsing, who took it in his, and after stooping and kissing it reverently, held it fast. The other hand was locked in that of her husband, who held his other arm thrown round her protectingly. After a pause in which she was evidently ordering her thoughts, she began. I took the sleeping draught which you had so kindly given me, but for a long time it did not act. I seemed to become more wakeful, and myriads of horrible fancies began to crowd in upon my mind, all of them connected with death, and vampires, with blood, and pain, and trouble. Her husband involuntarily groaned, and as she turned to him and said lovingly, "'Do not fret, dear. You must be brave and strong, and help me through this horrible task. If you only knew what an effort it is to me to tell of this fearful thing at all, you would understand how much I need your help.' Well, I saw I must try to help the medicine to do its work with my will, if it was to do me any good, so I resolutely set myself to sleep. Sure enough, sleep must soon have come to me, for I remember no more. Jonathan coming in had not waked me, for he lay by my side when next I remember. There was in the room the same thin white mist that I had before noticed. But I forget now if you know of this. You will find it in my diary, which I shall show you later." I felt the same vague terror which had come to me before, and the same sense of some presence. I turned to wake Jonathan, but found that he slept so soundly that it seemed as if it was he who had taken the sleeping draught, and not I. I tried, but I could not wake him. This caused me a great fear, and I looked around terrified. Then, indeed, my heart sank within me, beside the bed, as if he had stepped out of the mist, or rather as if the midst had turned into his figure, for it had entirely disappeared, stood a tall, thin man, all in black. I knew him at once from the description of the others. The waxen face, the high aquiline nose, on which the light fell in a thin white line, the parted red lips, with the sharp white teeth showing between, and the red eyes that I had seemed to see in the sunset on the windows of St. Mary's Church of Whitby. I knew, too, the red scar on his forehead where Jonathan had struck him. For an instant my heart stood still, and I would have screamed out, only that I was paralyzed. In the pause he spoke in a sort of keen cutting whisper, pointing as he spoke to Jonathan. "'Silence! If you make a sound, I shall take him and dash his brains out before your very eyes.' I was appalled, and was too bewildered to do or say anything. With a mocking smile he placed one hand upon my shoulder, and, holding me tight, bared my throat with the other, saying as he did so, First, a little refreshment to reward my exertions. You may as well be quiet. It is not the first time or the second that your veins have appeased my thirst.' I was bewildered, and strangely enough I did not want to hinder him. I suppose it is a part of the horrible curse that such is, when his touch is on his victim. And, oh, my God, my God, pity me! He placed his reeking lips upon my throat. Her husband groaned again. She clasped his hand harder and looked at him pityingly, as if he were the injured one, and went on. I felt my strength fading away, and I was in a half-swoon. How long this horrible thing lasted I know not, but it seemed that a long time must have passed before he took his foul, awful, sneering mouth away, and I saw it drip with the fresh blood. The remembrance seemed for a while to overpower her, and she drooped and would have sunk down but for her husband's sustaining arm. With a great effort she recovered herself and went on. Then he spoke to me mockingly, "'And so you, like the others, would play your brains against mine. You would help these men to hunt me and frustrate me in my design.' You know now, and they know in part already, and will know in full before long, what it is to cross my path. They should have kept their energies for use closer to home, whilst they played wits against me, against me who commanded nations, and intrigued for them, and fought for them. Hundreds of years before they were born I was countermining them. And you, their best beloved one, are now to me, flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood, kin of my kin, my bountiful winepress for a while, and shall be later on my companion and my helper. You shall be avenged in turn, for not one of them but shall minister to your needs. But as yet you are to be punished for what you have done. You have aided in thwarting me. Now you shall come to my call. When my brain says, Come to you, you shall cross land or sea to do my bidding, and to that end this— 
With that he pulled open his shirt, and with his long sharp nails opened a vein in his breast. When the blood began to spurt out, he took my hands in one of his, holding them tight, and with the other seized my neck and pressed my mouth to the wound, so that I must either suffocate or swallow some to the— Oh, my God! My God! What have I done? What have I done to deserve such a fate, I who have tried to walk in meekness and righteousness all my days? God pity me! Look down on a poor soul in worse than mortal peril, and in mercy pity those to whom she is dear. Then she began to rub her lips, as though to cleanse them from pollution. As she was telling her terrible story, the eastern sky began to quicken, and everything became more and more clear. Harker was still and quiet, but over his face, as the awful narrative went on, came a gray look, which deepened and deepened in the morning light, till when the first red streak of the coming dawn shot up, the flesh stood darkly out against the whitening hair. We have arranged that one of us is to stay within call of the unhappy pair till we can meet together and arrange about taking action. Of this I am sure. The sun rises today on no more miserable house in all the great round of its daily course. Chapter 22 Jonathan Harker's Journal October 3rd As I must do something or go mad, I write this diary. It is now six o'clock and we are to meet in the study in half an hour and take something to eat. For Dr. Val Helsing and Dr. Seward are agreed that if we do not eat, we cannot work our best. Our best will be, God knows, required today. I must keep writing at every chance, for I dare not stop to think. All, big and little, must go down. Perhaps at the end the little things may teach us most. The teaching, big or little, could not have landed Mina or me anywhere worse than we are today. However, we must trust and hope. Poor Mina told me just now, with tears running down her dear cheeks, that it is in trouble and trial that our faith is tested, that we must keep on trusting, and that God will aid us up to the end. The end! Oh, my God, what end! To work, to work! When Dr. Val Helmsing and Dr. Seward had come back from seeing poor Renfield, we went gravely into what was to be done. First, Dr. Siebert told us that when he and Dr. Van Helsing had gone down to the room below, they had found Renfield lying on the floor, all in a heap. His face was all bruised and crushed in, and the bones of the neck were broken. Dr. Seward asked the attendant who was on duty in the passage if he had heard anything. He said that he had been sitting down, he confessed to half dozing, when he heard loud voices in the room and that Renfield had called out loudly several times, God, God, God. After that, there was the sound of falling. When he entered the room, he found him lying on the floor, face down, just as the doctors had seen him. Van Helsing asked if he had heard voices or a voice, and he said he could not say, that at first it had seemed to him as if there were two, but as there was no one in the room, it could have been only one. He could swear to it, if required, that the word God was spoken by the patient. Dr. Sievert said to us, when we were alone, that he did not wish to go into the matter. The question of an inquest had to be considered, and it would never do to put forward the truth, as no one would believe it. As it was, he thought that on the attendant's evidence, he could give a certificate of death by misadventure in falling from bed. In case the coroner should demand it, there would be a formal inquest necessarily to the same result. When the question began to be discussed as to what should be our next step, the very first thing we decided was that Mina should be in full confidence, that nothing of any sort, no matter how painful, should be kept from her. She herself agreed to its wisdom, and it was pitiful to see her so brave and yet so sorrowful and in such depth of despair. There must be no concealment, she said. Alas, we have had too much already, and besides, there is nothing in all the world that can give me more pain than I have already endured, than I suffer now. Whatever may happen, it must be of new hope or of new courage to me. Van Helsing was looking at her fixedly as she spoke and said, suddenly but quietly, But dear Madam Mina, are you not afraid? Not for yourself, but for others from yourself, after what has happened? Her face grew set in its lines, but her eyes shone with the devotion of a martyr as she answered, Ah, no, for my mind is made up. To what? he asked gently, whilst we were all very still, for each in our own way, 
we had a sort of vague idea of what she meant. Her answer came with direct simplicity, as though she was simply stating a fact. Because if I find it in myself, and I shall certainly watch keenly for it, a sign of harm to any that I love, I shall die. You would kill yourself? he asked hoarsely. I would, if there were no friend who loved me, who would save me from such a pain and so desperate an effort. She looked at him meaningly as she spoke. He was sitting down, but now he rose and came close to her and put his hand on her head as he said solemnly, My child, there is such a one, if it were for your good, for myself, I could hold it in my account with God to find such a euthanasia for you, even at this moment, if it were best, nay, if it were safe. But my child! For a moment he seemed choked, and a great sob rose in his throat. He gulped down and went on. There are here some who would stand between you and death. You must not die. You must not die by any hand, but least of all your own, until the other who has fouled your sweet life, is true dead, you must not die, for if he is still with the quick undead, your death would make you even as he is. No, you must live, you must struggle and strive to live, though death would seem a boon unspeakable. You must fight death himself, though he come to you in pain or in joy, by the day or the night, in safety or in peril, on your living soul I charge you that you do not die, nay, nor think of death, till this great evil be past. The poor dear grew white as death, and shook and shivered as I have seen a quicksand shiver and shake at the incoming of a tide. We were all silent. We could do nothing. At length she grew more calm, and turning to him said sweetly, but oh so sorrowfully, as she held out her hand, I promise you, my dear friend, that if God will let me live, I shall strive to do so, till, if it may be in his good time, this horror may have passed from me. She was so good and brave that we all felt that our hearts were strengthened to work and endure for her, and we began to discuss what we were to do. I told her that she was to have all the papers in the safe, and all the papers or diaries and phonographs that we might hereafter use and was to keep the record as she, as she had done before. She was pleased with the prospect of anything to do, if pleased could be used in connection with so grim an interest. As usual, Van Helsing had thought ahead of everyone else, and was prepared with an exact ordering of our work. It is perhaps well, he said, that at our meeting after our visit to Carfax, we decided not to do anything with the earth boxes that lay there. Had we done so, the Count must have guessed our purpose, and would doubtless have taken measures in advance to frustrate such effort as regard to the others. But now he does not know our intentions. Nay, more in all probability he does not know that such a power exists to us as can sterilize his lairs, so that he cannot use them as of old. We are now so much further advanced in our knowledge as to their disposition, that when we have examined the house in Piccadilly, we may track the very last of them. Today then is ours, and in it rests our hope. The sun that rose on our sorrow this morning guards us in its course. Until it sets tonight, that monster must retain whatever form he now has. He is confined within the limitations of his earthly envelope. He cannot melt into thin air, nor disappear through cracks or chinks or crannies. If he goes through a doorway, he must open the door like a mortal. And so we have this day to hunt down all his lairs and sterilize them. So we shall, if we have not yet catch him and destroy him, drive him to bay in some place where the catching and the destroying shall be in time, sure. Here I started up, for I could not contain myself at the thought that the minutes and seconds so preciously laden with Nina's life and happiness were flying from us, since whilst we talked, action was impossible. But Van Helsing held up his hand warningly. Nay, friend Jonathan, he said, in this the quickest way home is the longest way, so your proverbs say. We shall all act and act with desperate quick when the time has come. But think, in all probable, the key of the situation is in that house in Piccadilly. 
the Count may have many houses which he has bought. Of them he will have deeds of purchase, keys, and other things. He will have paper that he write on. He will have his books of checks. There are so many belongings that he must have somewhere. Why not in this place so central, so quiet, where he come and go by the front or the back at all hours, when, in the very vast of the traffic, there is none to notice? We shall go there and search that house, and when we learn what it holds, then we do what our friend Arthur calls, in his phrases of hunt, stop the earth, and so we run down our old fox. So, is it no? Then let us come at once, I cried. We are wasting the precious, precious time. The professor did not move, but simply said, And how are we to get into that house in Piccadilly? Anyway, I cried, we shall break in if need be. And your police? Where will they be, and what will they say? I was staggered, but I knew that if he wished to delay, he had a good reason for it. So I said as quietly as I could, Don't wait more than need be. You know I am sure what torture I am in. Ah, my child, that I do, and indeed there is no wish of me to add to your anguish. But just think what can we do until all the world be at movement. Then will come our time. I have thought and thought, and it seems to me the simplest way is the best of all. Now, we wish to get into the house, but we have no key. Is it not so? I nodded. Now, suppose that you were, in truth, the owner of the house, and could not still get in, and think there was to you no conscience of the housebreaker, what would you do? I should get me a respectable locksmith and set him to work to pick the lock for me. And your police, they would interfere, would they not? Oh, no, not if they knew the man was properly employed. Then, he looked at me as keenly as he spoke, all that is in doubt is the conscience of the employer and the belief of your policeman as to whether or not that employer has a good conscience or a bad one. Your police must indeed be zealous men and clever, oh, so clever in reading the heart that they trouble themselves in such matter. No, no, my friend Jonathan, you go take the lock off a hundred empty houses in this your London or of any city in the world, and if you do it as such things are rightly done, and at the time such things are rightly done, no one will interfere. I have read of a gentleman who owned a so fine house in London, and when he went for months of summer to Switzerland and locked up his house, some burglar come and broke window at back and got in. Then he went and made open the shutters in front and walk out and in through the door before the very eyes of the police. Then he had an auction in that house and advertised it and put up big notice. And when the day come, he sell off by a great auctioneer all the goods of that other man who owned them. Then he go to a builder and he sell him that house making an agreement that he pull it down and take all away within a certain time. And your police and other authorities help him all they can. And when that owner come back from his holiday in Switzerland, he find only an empty hole where his house had been. This was all done in wrongler, and in our work we shall be on wrongler too. We shall not go so early that policemen who have little to think of shall deem it strange. But we shall go after ten o'clock. When there are many about, and such things would be done, were we indeed owners of the house? I could not but see how right he was, and the terrible despair of Mina's face became relaxed in thought. There was hope in such good counsel. Van Helsing went on. When once within the house, we may find more clues. At any rate, some of us can remain there, whilst the rest find the other places where there be more earth boxes at Bermondsey and Miles End. Lord Godalming stood up. I can be of some use here, he said. I shall wire to my people to have horses and carriages where they will be most convenient. Look here, old fellow, said Morris. It is a capital idea to have all ready in case you want to go horsebacking, but don't you think that one of your snappy carriages with its heraldic adornments in a byway of Walsworth or Miles End would attract too much attention for our purpose. 
It seems to me we ought to take cabs when we go south or east, or even leave them somewhere near the neighbourhood where we are going to. Friend Quincy is right, said the professor. His head is what you call in plane with the horizon. It is a difficult thing that we go to do, and we do not want no peoples to watch us, if so it may. Mina took a growing interest in everything, and I was rejoiced to see that the exigencies of affairs was helping her to forget for a time the terrible experience of the night. She was very, very pale, almost ghastly, and so thin that her lips were drawn away, showing her teeth in somewhat of prominence. I did not mention this last, lest it should give her needless pain, but it made my blood run cold in my veins to think of what had occurred with poor Lucy when the Count had sucked her blood. As yet there was no sign of the teeth growing sharper, but the time was as yet short, and there was time for fear. When we came to the discussion of the sequence of our efforts and of the disposition of our forces, there were new sources of doubt. It was finally agreed that before starting for Piccadilly, we should destroy the Count's lair close at hand. In case he should find it out too soon, we would thus still be ahead of him in our work of destruction. And his presence in his purely material shape, and at his weakest, might give us some new clue. As to the disposition of forces, it was suggested by the professor that after our visit to Carfax, we should all enter the house in Piccadilly that the two doctors and I should remain there whilst Lord Goddamring and Quincy found the lairs at Walsworth and Miles End and destroyed them. It was possible, if not likely, the professor urged, that the Count may appear in Piccadilly during the day, and that, if so, we might be able to cope with him there and then. At any rate, we might be able to follow him in force. To this plan I strenuously objected, and so far as my going was concerned, for I said that I intended to stay and protect Mina. I thought that my mind was made up on the subject, but Mina would not listen to my objections. She said that that might be some law matter in which I could be useful, that amongst the Count's papers might be some clue which I could understand out of my experience in Transylvania, and that, as it was, all the strength we could muster was required to cope with the Count's extraordinary power. I had to give in, for Mina's resolution was fixed. She said that it was the last hope for her that we should all work together. As for me, she said, I have no fear. Things have been as bad as they can be, and whatever may happen must have in it some element of hope or comfort. Go, my husband. God can, if he wishes it, guard me as well alone as with any one present. So I started up, crying out, then in God's name let us come at once, for we are losing time. The Count may come to Piccadilly earlier than we think. Not so, said Van Helsing, holding up his hand. But why, I asked. Do you forget, he said with actually a smile, that last night he banqueted heavily and will sleep late. Did I forget? Shall I ever, can I ever... Can any of us ever forget that terrible scene? Mina struggled hard to keep her brave countenance, but the pain overmastered her, and she put her hands before her face and shuddered whilst she moaned. Van Helsing had not intended to recall her frightful experience. He had simply lost sight of her and her part in the affair in his intellectual effort. When it struck him what he said, he was horrified at his thoughtlessness and tried to comfort her. Oh, Madam Mina, he said, dear, dear Madam Mina, alas, that I, of all who so reverence you, should have said anything so forgetful. These stupid old lips of mine and the stupid old head do not deserve so, but you will forget it, will you not? He bent low beside her as he spoke. She took his hand, and looking at him through her tears, said hoarsely, No. I shall not forget, for it is well that I remember, and with it I have so much in memory of you that is sweet that I take it all together. Now, you must all be going soon. Breakfast is ready, and we must all eat that we may be strong. Breakfast was a strange meal to us all. We tried to be cheerful and encourage each other, and Mina was the brightest and most cheerful of us. When it was over, 
Van Helsing stood up and said, Now, my dear friends, we go forth to our terrible enterprise. Are we all armed, as we were on that night when first we visited our enemy's lair, armed against ghostly as well as carnal attacks? We all assured him. Then it is well. Now, Madamina, you are in any case quite safe here until the sunset. And before then we shall return, if... We shall return. But before we go, let me see you armed against personal attack. I have myself, since you came down, prepared your chamber by the placing of things of which we know, so that he may not enter. Now let me guard yourself. On your forehead, I touch this piece of sacred wafer in the name of the Father, the Son, and... There was a fearful scream which almost froze our hearts to hear... As he had placed the wafer on Mina's forehead, it had seared it, had burnt into the flesh as though it had been a piece of white-hot metal. My poor darling's brain had told her the significance of the fact as quickly as her nerves received the pain of it, and the two so overwhelmed her that her overwrought nature had its voice in that dreadful scream. But the words to her thought came quickly. The echo of the scream had not ceased to ring on the air when there came the reaction, and she sank on her knees on the floor in an agony of abasement. Pulling her beautiful hair over her face, as the leper of old his mantle, she wailed out, Unclean! Unclean! Even the Almighty shuns my polluted flesh. I must bear this mark of shame on my forehead until judgment day. They all paused. I had thrown myself beside her in an agony of helpless grief and putting my arms around her, held her tight. For a few moments, our sorrowful hearts beat together while the friends around us turned away their eyes that ran tears silently. Then, when Helsing turned and said gravely, so gravely that I could not help feeling that he was in some way inspired and was stating things outside himself, it may be that you shall have to bear that mark till God himself sees fit, as he most surely shall, on that judgment day, to redress all wrongs of the earth and of his children that he has placed thereon. And, O oh, Madamina, my dear, my dear, may we who love you be there to see when that red scar, the sign of God's knowledge of what has been, shall pass away and leave your forehead as pure as the heart we know. For so surely as we live, that scar shall pass away when God sees right to lift the burden that is hard upon us. Till then we bear our cross, as his son did in, his, in obedience to his will. It may be that we are chosen instruments of his good pleasure, and that we ascend to his bidding as that other through stripes and shame, through fears and blood, through doubts and fear, and all that makes the difference between God and man. There was hope in his voice, and comfort, and the need for resignation. Mina and I both felt so, and simultaneously we each took one of the old man's hands, and bent over it and kissed it. Then, without a word, we all knelt down together, and all holding hands, swore to be true to each other. We men pledged ourselves to raise the veil of sorrow from the head of her whom, each in his own way, we loved, and we prayed for help and guidance in the terrible task which lay before us. It was then time to start. So I said farewell to Mina, a parting which neither of us shall forget to our dying day, and we set out. To one thing I have made up my mind. If we find out that Mina must be a vampire in the end, then she shall not go into that unknown and terrible land alone. I suppose it is thus that in old times one vampire meant many. Just as their hideous bodies could only rest in sacred earth, so the holiest love was the recruiting sergeant for their ghastly ranks. We entered Carfax without trouble and found all things the same as on that first occasion. It was hard to believe that amongst so prosaic surroundings of neglect and dust and decay, there was any ground for such fear as already we knew. Had not our minds been made up, and had there not been terrible memories to spur us on, we could hardly have proceeded with our tasks. We found no papers, or any sign of use in the house. 
and in the old chapel the great boxes looked just as we had seen them last. Dr. Van Helsing said to us solemnly as we stood before him, And now, my friends, we have a duty here to do. We must sterilize this earth so sacred of holy memories that he has brought from a far distant land for such fell use. He has chosen this earth because it has been holy. Thus we defeat him with his own weapon, for we make it more holy still. It was sanctified to such use of man, now we sanctify it to God. As he spoke, he took from his bag a screwdriver and a wrench, and very soon the top of one of the cases was thrown open. The earth smelled musty and close, but we did not somehow seem to mind, for our attention was concentrated on the professor. Taking from his box a piece of the sacred wafer, he laid it down reverently on the earth, and then shutting down the lid began to screw it home, we aiding him as he worked. One by one we treated in the same way each of the great boxes, and left them as we had found them to all appearances, but in each was a portion of the host. When we closed the door behind us, the professor said solemnly, So much is already done. It may be that with all the others we can be so successful. Then the sunset of this evening may shine of Madame Mina's forehead all white as ivory and with no stain. As we passed across the lawn on our way to the station to catch our train, we could see the front of the asylum. I looked eagerly and in the window of my own room saw Mina. I waved my hand to her and nodded to tell that our work there was successfully accomplished. She nodded in reply to show that she understood. The last I saw her, she was waving her hand in farewell. It was with a heavy heart that we sought the station and just caught the train, which was steaming in as we reached the platform. I have written this in the train. Piccadilly, 12.30 o'clock. Just before we reached Fenchurch Street, Lord Godamring said to me, Quincy and I will find a locksmith. You had better not come with us in case there should be any difficulty. For under the circumstances, it wouldn't seem so bad for us to break into an empty house. But you are a solicitor, and the Incorporated Law Society might tell you that you should have known better. I demurred as to my not sharing any danger, even of odium, but he went on. Besides, it will attract less attention if there are not too many of us. My title will make it all right with the locksmith and with any police that might come along. You had better go with Jack and the professor and stay in Green Park, somewhere in sight of the house. And when you see the door opened and the smith has gone away, do you all come across? We shall be on the lookout for you and shall let you in. The advice is good, said Van Helsing, so we said no more. Coddling and Morris hurried off in a cab, we following in another. At the corner of Arlington Street, our contingent got out and strolled into the green park. My heart beat as I saw the house on which so much of our hope was centred, looming up grim and silent in its deserted condition amongst its more lively and spruced-up neighbours. We sat down on a bench within good view and began to smoke cigars so as to attract as little attention as possible. The minutes seemed to pass with leaden feet as we waited for the coming of the others. At length, we saw a four-wheeler drive up. Out of it, in leisurely fashion, got Lord Godamring and Morris, and down from the box descended a thick-set working man with his rush-woven basket of tools. Morris paid the cabman, who touched his hat, and drove away. Together, the two ascended the steps, and Lord Godamring pointed out what he wanted done. The workman took off his coat leisurely and hung it on one of the spikes of the rail, saying something to the policeman who just then sauntered by. The policeman nodded acquiescence, and the man kneeling down placed his bag beside him. After searching through it, he took out a selection of tools, which he proceeded to lay beside him in orderly fashion. Then he stood up, looked in the keyhole, blew into it, and turning to his employers, made some remark. Lord Godamring smiled, and the man lifted a good-sized bunch of keys. Selecting one of them, he began to probe the lock, as if feeling his way with it. 
After fumbling about for a bit, he tried a second and then a third. All at once, the door opened under a slight push from him, and he and the two others entered the hall. We sat still. My own cigar burned furiously, but Van Helsing's went cold altogether. We waited patiently as we saw the workman come out and bring his bag. Then he held the door partly open, steadying it with his knees, whilst he fitted a key to the lock. This he finally handed to Lord Godamring, who took out his purse and gave him something. The man touched his hat, took his bag, put on his coat and departed. Not a soul took the slightest notice of the whole transaction. When the man had fairly gone, we three crossed the street and knocked at the door. It was immediately opened by Quincy Morris, besides whom stood Lord Godlemring lighting a cigar. The place smells so vilely, said the latter as we walked in. It did indeed smell vilely, like the old chapel at Carfax. And with our previous experience, it was plain to us that the Count had been using the place pretty freely. We moved to explore the house, all keeping together in case of attack, for we knew we had a strong and wily enemy to deal with, and as yet we did not know whether the Count might not be in the house. In the dining room, which lay at the back of the hall, we found eight boxes of earth. Eight boxes only out of the nine which we sought. Our work was not over, and would never be until we had found the missing box. First, we opened the shutters of a window, which looked out across a narrow stone flagged yard at the blank face of a stable, pointed to look like the front of a miniature house. There were no windows in it, so we were not afraid of being overlooked. We did not lose any time in examining the chests. With the tools which we had brought with us, we opened them one by one, and treated them as we had treated those others in the old chapel. It was evident to us that the Count was not at present in the house, and we proceeded to search for any of his effects. After a cursory glance at the rest of the rooms, from basement to attic, we came to the conclusion that the dining room contained any effects which might belong to the Count, and so we proceeded to minutely examine them. They lay in a sort of orderly disorder on the great dining room table, there were title deeds of the Piccadilly house in a great bundle, deeds of the purchase of the houses at Miles End and Bermondsey, note paper envelopes and pens and ink, all were covered up in a thin wrapping paper to keep them from the dust. There was also a clothes brush, a brush and comb, and a jug and basin, the latter containing dirty water which was reddened as if with blood. Last of all was a little heap of keys of all sorts and sizes, probably those belonging to the other houses. When we had examined this last find, Lord Godalming and Quincy Morris, taking accurate notes of the various addresses of the houses in the east and south, took with them the keys in a great bunch and set out to destroy the boxes in these places. The rest of us are, with what patience we can, waiting their return or the coming of the Count. Chapter 23 Dr. Seward's Diary October 3rd The time seemed terribly long whilst we were waiting for the coming of our Godamling and Quincy Morris. The professor tried to keep our minds active by using them all the time. I could see his beneficent purpose by the side glances which he threw from time to time at Harker. The poor fellow was overwhelmed in a misery that is appalling to see. Last night he was a frank, happy-looking man, with strong, youthful face, full of energy and with dark brown hair. Today he is a drawn, haggard old man, whose white hair matches well with the hollow, burning eyes and grief-written lines of his face. His energy is still intact. In fact, he is like a living flame. This may yet be his salvation, for if all go well, it will tide him over the despairing period. He will then, in a kind of way, wake again to the realities of life. Poor fellow! I thought my own trouble was bad enough, but his— The professor knows this well enough, and is doing his best to keep his mind active. What he has been saying was, under the circumstances of absorbing interest. So well as I can remember, here it is. I have studied, over and over again since they came into my hands, all the papers relating to this monster, and the more I have studied, the greater seems the necessity to utterly stamp him out. All through there are signs of his advance, not only of his power, but of his knowledge of it. As I learned from the researches of my friend Armanis of Budapest, 
He was in life a most wonderful man, soldier, statesman, and alchemist, which latter was the highest development of the science knowledge of his time. He had a mighty brain, a learning beyond compare, and a heart that knew no fear and no remorse. He dared even to attend the Schlochmanns, and there was no branch of knowledge of his time that he did not essay. Well, in him the brain power survived the physical death, though it would seem that memory was not all complete. In some faculties of mind he has, and is, only a child. But he is growing, and some things that were childish at the first are now of man's stature. He is experimenting, and doing it well. And if it had not been that we had crossed his path, he would be yet, he may be yet, if we fail, the father or furtherer of a new life of beings, whose road must lead through death, not life. Harker groaned and said, "'And this is all arrayed against my darling. But how is he experimenting? The knowledge may help us to defeat him.' He has all along, since his coming, been trying his power, slowly but surely. That big child-brain of his is working. Well, for us, it is as yet a child-brain. For had he dared, at the first, to attempt certain things, he would long ago have been beyond our power. However, he means to succeed, and a man who has centuries before him can afford to wait and go slow. Festina lente may well be his motto. I fail to understand, said Harker wearily. Oh, do be more plain to me. Perhaps grief and trouble are dulling my brain. The professor laid his hand tenderly on his shoulder as he spoke. Ah, my child, I will be plain. Do you not see how, of late, this monster has been creeping into knowledge experimentally? He has been making use of the zophagist patient to the affect his entry into friend John's home, for your vampire, though in all afterwards he can come how and when he will, must at the first make entry only when asked thereto by an inmate. But these are not his most important experiments. Do we not see how at the first all these great boxes were moved by others? He knew not then, but that must be so. But all the time that so great child-brain of his was growing, and he began to consider whether he might not himself move the box. So he began to try to help. And then, when he found that this be all right, he tried to move them all alone. And so he progress, and he scattered these graves of him, and none but he know where they are hidden. He may have intended to bury them deep in the ground, so that only he may use them in the night, or at such time as he can change his form. They do him equal well, and none may know these are his hiding-place. But, my child, do not despair. This knowledge came to him just too late. Already all of his lairs but one be sterilized as for him. And before the sunset this shall be so. Then he have no place where he can move and hide. I delayed this morning so that we might be sure. Is there not more at stake for us than for him? Then why not be more careful than him? By my clock it is one hour already, and if all be well, our friend Arthur and Quincy are on their way to us. Today is our day, and we must go sure, if slow, and lose no chance. See, there are five of us when those absent ones return. Whilst we were speaking, we were startled by a knock at the hall door, the double postman's knock of the telegraph boy. We all moved out to the hall with one impulse, and Van Helsing, holding up his hand to us to keep silence, stepped to the door and opened it. The boy handed in a dispatch. The professor closed the door again, and after looking at the direction, opened it and read aloud. Look out for D. He has just now, 12.45, come from Carfax hurriedly and hastened towards the south. He seems to be going the round and may want to see you, Mina. There was a pause, broken by Jonathan Harker's voice. Now, God be thanked, we shall soon meet. Van Helsing turned to him quickly and said, God will act in his own way and time. Do not fear and do not rejoice as yet, for what we wish for at the moment may be our own undoings. "'I care for nothing now,' he answered hotly, "'except to wipe out this brute from the face of creation. "'I would sell my soul to do it.' "'Oh, hush, hush, my child,' said Van Helsing. "'God does not purchase souls in this wise, "'and the devil, though he may purchase, does not keep faith. "'But God is merciful and just, "'and knows your pain and your devotion to that dear Madame Mina. "'Think you how her pain would be doubled "'did she but hear your wild words. "'Do not fear any of us. "'We are all devoted to this cause, "'and to-day shall see the end.' The time is coming for action. Today this vampire is limit to the powers of man, until sunset he may not change. It will take him time yet to arrive here. See, it is twenty minutes past one, and there are yet some times before he can hither come, 
be he ever so quick. What we must hope for is that my Lord Arthur and Quincy arrive first. About half an hour after we received Mrs. Harker's telegram, there came a quiet, resolute knock at the hall door. It was just an ordinary knock, such as is given hourly by thousands of gentlemen, but it made the professor's heart and mind beat loudly. We looked at each other, and together moved out into the hall. We each held ready to use our various armaments, the spiritual in the left hand, the mortal in the right. Van Helsing pulled back the latch, and holding the door half open, stood back, having both hands ready for action. The gladness of our hearts must have shone upon our faces, when on the step, close to the door, we saw Lord Gadamling and Quincy Morris. They came in quickly, and closed the door behind them, the former saying, as they moved along the hall, "'It is all right. We found both places. Six boxes in each, and we destroyed them all.' "'Destroyed?' asked the professor. "'For him.' We were silent for a minute, and then Quincy said, "'There's nothing to do but wait here. If, however, he doesn't turn up by five o'clock, we must start off, for it won't do to leave Mrs. Harker alone after sunset.' "'He will be here before long now,' said Van Helsing, who had been consulting his pocket-book. "'Nota bene, in Madame's telegram he went south from Carfax. That means he went to cross the river, and he could only do so at slack of tide, which should be something before one o'clock.' That he went south has a meaning for us. He is as yet only suspicious, and he went from Carfax first to the place where he would suspect interference least. You must have been at Bermondsey only a short time before him. That he is not here already shows that he went to Mile End next. This took him some time, for he would then have to be carried over the river in some way. Believe me, my friends, we shall not have long to wait now. We should have ready some plan of attack, so that we may throw away no chance. "'Hush! There is no time now. Have all your arms. Be ready!' He held up a warning hand as he spoke, for we all could hear a key softly inserted into the lock of the hall door. I could not but admire, even at such a moment, the way in which a dominant spirit asserts itself. In all our hunting parties and adventures in different parts of the world, Quincy Morris had always been the one to arrange the plan of action, and Arthur and I seemed to be accustomed to obey him implicitly. Now the old habit seemed to be renewed instinctively. With a swift glance round the room, he at once laid out our plan of attack, and without speaking a word, with a gesture, placed each of us in position. Then Helsing, Harker, and I were just behind the door, so that when it opened, the professor could guard it whilst we two stepped between the intercover and the door. Godamling behind, and Quincy in front, stood just out of sight, ready to move in front of the window. We waited in a suspense that made the seconds pass with nightmare slowness. The slow, careful steps came along the hall. The Count was evidently prepared for some surprise. At least he feared it. Suddenly, with a single bound, he leapt into the room, winning away past us before any of us could raise a hand to stay him. There was something so panther-like in the movement, something so unhuman, that it seemed to sober us all from the shock of his coming. The first to act was Harker, who, with a quick movement, threw himself before the door leading into the room in front of the house. As the Count saw us, a horrible sort of snarl passed over his face— "'showing the eye-tooth long and pointed. "'But the evil smile is quickly passed into a cold stare of lion-like disdain. "'His expression again changed, as, with a single impulse, we all advanced upon him. "'It was a pity that we had not some better yet organized plan of attack, "'for even at the moment I wondered what we were to do. "'I did not myself know whether our lethal weapons would avail of us anything. "'Harker evidently meant to try the matter, for he had ready his great kukuri knife "'and made a fierce and sudden cut at him. The blow was a powerful one, only the diabolical quickness of the Count's leap back saved him. A second less, and the trenchant blade had shorn through his heart. As it was, the point just cut the cloth of his coat, making a wide gap whence a bundle of banknotes and stream of gold fell out. The expression of the Count's face was so hellish that for a moment I feared for Harker, though I saw him throw the terrible knife aloft again for another stroke. Instinctively I moved forward and with a protective impulse, holding the crucifix and wafer in my left hand, I felt a mighty power fly along my arm, and it was without surprise that I saw the monster cower back before a similar movement made spontaneously by each one of us. It would be impossible to describe the expression of hate and baffled malignity, of anger and hellish rage, which came over the Count's face. His waxen hue became greenish-yellow by the contrast of his burning eyes, and the red scar on the forehead showed on the pallid skin like a palpitating wound. The next instant, with a sinuous dive, he swept under Harker's arm, ere his blow could fall, and, grasping a handful of the money from the floor, dashed across the room, threw himself at the window. Amid the crash and glitter of the falling glass, he tumbled into the flagged area below. 
Through the sound of the shivering glass I could hear the ting of the gold as some of the sovereigns fell on the flagging. We ran over and saw him spring, unhurt from the ground. He, rushing up the stairs, crossed the flagged yard, and pushed open the stable door. There he turned and spoke to us. "'You think to baffle me, you with your pale faces all in a row, like sheep in a butcher's? You shall be sorry yet, each one of you. You think that you have left me without place to rest, but I have more. My revenge is just begun. I spread it over centuries, and time is on my side. Your girls that you all love are mine already.' and through them you and others shall yet be mine, my creatures, to do my bidding and be my jackals when I want to feed. Bah! With a contemptuous sneer he passed quickly through the door, and we heard the rusty bolt creak as he fastened it behind him. A door beyond opened and shut. The first of us to speak was the professor. Realizing the difficulty of following him through the stable, we moved towards the hall. We have learned something, much. Notwithstanding his brave words, he fears us. He fears time, he fears want. For if not, why hurry so? His very tone betray him, or my ears deceive. Why take that money? You follow quick. You are hunters of the wild beast, and understand it so. For me, I make sure that nothing here may be of use to him, if so that he returns. As he spoke, he put the money remaining in his pocket, took the title deeds in the bundle as Harker had left them, and swept the remaining things into the open fireplace, where he set fire to them with a match. Godamling and Morris rushed out into the yard, and Harker lowered, lowered himself from the window to follow the count. He had, however, bolted the stable door, and by the time they had forced it open there was no sign of him. Van Helsing and I tried to make inquiry at the back of the house, but the mews was deserted and no one had seen him depart. It was now late in the afternoon, and sunset was not far off. We had to recognize that our game was up. With heavy hearts we agreed with the professor when he said, "'Let us go back now to Madame Mina.' "'Poor, poor, dear Madame Mina. "'All we can do just now is done, "'and we can there at least protect her. "'But we need not despair. "'There is but one more earth-box, "'and we must try to find it. "'When that is done, all may yet be well.' "'I could see that he spoke as bravely as he could "'to comfort Harker. "'The poor fellow was quite broken down. "'Now and again he gave a low groan, "'which he could not suppress. "'He was thinking of his wife. "'With sad hearts we came back to my house, "'where we found Mrs. Harker waiting us, with an appearance of cheerfulness which did honour to her bravery and unselfishness. When she saw our faces, her own became as pale as death. For a second or two her eyes were closed as if she were in secret prayer. And then she said cheerfully, "'I can never thank you all enough. Oh, my poor darling!' As she spoke, she took her husband's grey head in her hands and kissed it. "'May your poor head hear and rest it. All will be well, dear. God will protect us if he so will it in his good intent.' The poor fellow groaned. There was no place for words in his sublime misery. We had a sort of perfunctory supper together, and I think it cheered us all up somewhat. It was, perhaps, the mere animal heat of food to hungry people, for none of us had eaten anything since before breakfast, or the sense of companionship may have helped us. But anyhow, we were all less miserable, and we saw the morrow was not altogether without hope. True to our promise, we told Mrs. Harker everything which had passed— and although she grew snowy white at times when danger had seemed to threaten her husband, and red at others when his devotion to her was manifested, she listened bravely and without comment. When we came to the part where Harker had rushed at the Count so recklessly, she clung to her husband's arm and held it tight as though her clinging could protect him from any harm that might come. She said nothing, however, till the narration was all done, and matters had been brought up to the present time. Then, without letting go her husband's hand, she stood up amongst us and spoke. Oh, that I could give any idea of the scene, of that sweet, sweet, good, good woman and all the radiant beauty of her youth and animation, with the red scar on her forehead of which she was conscious, and which we saw with grinding of our teeth, remembering whence and how it came, her loving kindness against our grim hate, her tender faith against all our fears and doubting, and we, knowing that so far as symbols went, she, with all her goodness and purity and faith, was outcast from God. Jonathan, she said, and the word sounded like music on her lips, it was so full of love and tenderness. Jonathan, dear, and you all my true, true friends, I want you to bear something in mind through all this dreadful time. I know that you must fight, that you must destroy, even as you destroyed the false Lucy, so that the true Lucy might live hereafter. But it is not a work of hate. That poor soul who has wrought all this misery is the saddest case of all. Just think what will be his joy when he, too, is destroyed in his worser part, that his better part may have spiritual immortality. 
you must be pitiful to him too, though it may not hold your hands from his destruction. As she spoke, I could see her husband's face darken and draw together, as though the passion in him were shriveling his being to its core. Instinctively, the clasp on his wife's hand grew closer, till his knuckles looked white. She did not flinch from the pain which I knew she must have suffered, but looked at him with eyes that were more appealing than ever. As she stopped speaking, he leapt to his feet, almost tearing his hand from hers as he spoke. May God give him into my hand just for long enough to destroy that earthly life of him which we are aiming at. If beyond it I could send his soul forever and ever to burning hell, I would do it. Oh, hush! Oh, hush in the name of good God! Don't say such things, Jonathan, my husband, or you will crush me with fear and horror. Just think, my dear, I have been thinking all this long, long day of it, that perhaps... Some day, I too may need such pity, and that some other like you, and with equal cause for anger, may deny it me. O oh, my husband, my husband, indeed, I would pray have spared you such a thought had there been another way. But I pray that God may not have treasured your wild words, except as the heartbroken wail of a very loving and sorely stricken man. O oh, God, let these poor white hairs go in evidence of what he has suffered, who all his life has done no wrong, and on whom so many sorrows have come. We men all were in tears now. There was no resisting them, and we wept openly. She wept, too, to see that her sweeter counsels had prevailed. Her husband flung himself on his knees beside her, and putting his arms round her, hid his face in the folds of her dress. Van Helsing beckoned to us, and we stole out of the room, leaving the two loving hearts alone with their God. Before they retired, the professor fixed up the room against any coming of the vampire, and assured Mrs. Harker that she might rest in peace. She tried to school herself to the belief, and manifestly, for her husband's sake, tried to seem content. It was a brave struggle, and was, I think, and believe, not without its reward. Van Helsing had placed at hand a bell, which either of them was to sound in case of any emergency. When they had retired, Quincy, Godamling, and I arranged that we should sit up, dividing the night between us, and watch over the safety of the poor stricken lady. The first watch falls to Quincy, so the rest of us shall be off to bed as soon as we can." Godamling has already turned in, for his is the second watch. Now that my work is done, I, too, shall go to bed. Jonathan Harker's Journal 3-4 to 4 October, close to midnight. I thought yesterday would never end. There was over me a yearning for sleep, and some sort of blind belief that to wake would be to find things changed, that any change must now be for the better. Before we parted, we discussed what our next step was to be, but we could arrive at no result. All we knew was that there was one earth box remaining, and that the Count alone knew where it was. If he chooses to lie hidden, he may baffle us for years. And in the meantime, the thought is too horrible. I dare not think of it even now. This I know, that if ever there was a woman who was all perfection, that one is my poor wronged darling. I loved her a thousand times more for her sweet pity of last night, a pity that made my own hate of the monster seem despicable. Surely God will not permit the world to be the poorer by the loss of such a creature. This is a hope to me. We are all drifting reefwards now, and faith is our only anchor. Thank God. Mina is sleeping, and sleeping without dreams. I fear what her dreams must be like, with such terrible memories to ground them in. She has not been so calm, within my seeing, since the sunset. Then, for a while, there came over her face a repose which was like the spring after the blasts of March. I thought at the time that it was the softness of the red sunset on her face, but somehow now I think it has a deeper meaning. I am not sleepy myself, though I am weary, weary to death. However, I must try to sleep, for there is tomorrow to think of, and there is no rest for me until... later. I must have fallen asleep, for I was awakened by Mina, who was sitting up in bed with a startled look on her face. I could see easily, for we did not leave the room in darkness. She had placed a warning hand over my mouth, and now she whispered in my ear, "'Hush! There's someone in the corridor.' I got up softly, and crossing the room gently opened the door. Just outside, stretched on a mattress, lay Mr. Morris, wide awake. He raised a warning hand for silence as he whispered to me, "'Hush! Go back to bed. All is all right. One of us will be here all night. We don't mean to take any chances.' His look and gesture forbade discussion, so I came back and told Mina. She sighed, and positively a shadow of a smile stole over her poor pale face, as she put her arms round me and said softly, "'Oh, thank God for good brave men!' With a sigh she sank back again into sleep. I write this now as I am not sleepy, though I must try again. 4 October. Morning. 
Once again during the night I was wakened by Mina. This time we had all had a good sleep, for the grey of the coming dawn was making the windows into sharp oblongs, and the gas flume was like a speck rather than a disk of light. She said to me hurriedly, "'Go, call the professor. I want to see him at once.' "'Why?' I asked. "'I have an idea. I suppose it must have come in the night, and matured without my knowing it. He must hypnotize me before the dawn, and then I shall be able to speak. Go quick, dearest, the time is getting close.' I went to the door. Dr. Seward was resting on the mattress, and seeing me he sprang to his feet. "'Is anything wrong?' he asked in alarm. "'No,' I replied, "'but Mina wants to see Dr. Van Helsing at once.' "'I will go,' he said, and hurried into the professor's room. Two or three minutes later Van Helsing was in the room in his dressing-gown, and Mr. Morris and Lord Gadamling were there with Dr. Seward at the door asking questions. When the professor saw Mina, a smile, a positive smile, ousted the anxiety off his face. He rubbed his hands as he said, "'Oh, my dear Madame Mina, this is indeed a change. See, friend Jonathan, we have got our dear Madame Mina as old back to us to-day.' Then turning to her, he said cheerfully, "'And what am I to do for you? For at this hour you do not want me for nothing.' "'I want you to hypnotize me,' she said. "'Do it before the dawn, for I feel that that is when I can speak, and speak freely. "'Be quick, for time is short.' Without a word he motioned for her to sit up in bed. Looking fixedly at her, he commenced to make passes in front of her, from over the top of her head downward, with each hand in turn. Mina gazed at him fixedly for a few minutes, during which my own heart beat like a trip-hammer, for I felt that some crisis was at hand. Gradually her eyes closed, and she sat stock-still. Only by the gentle heaving of her bosom could one know that she was alive. The professor made a few more passes and then stopped, and I could see that his forehead was covered with great beads of perspiration. Mina opened her eyes, but she did not seem the same woman. There was a faraway look in her eyes, and her voice had a sad dreaminess which was new to me. Raising his hand to impose silence, the professor motioned to me to bring the others in. They came on tiptoe, closing the door behind them, and stood at the foot of the bed looking on. Mina appeared not to see them. The stillness was broken by Van Helsing's voice speaking in a low, level tone, which would not break the current of her thoughts. "'Where are you?' The answer came in a neutral way. "'I do not know.' Sleep has no place I can call its own. For several minutes there was silence. Mina sat rigid, and the professor stood staring at her fixedly. The rest of us hardly dared to breathe. The room was growing lighter. Without taking his eyes from Mina's face, Dr. Van Helsing motioned to me to pull up the blind. I did so, and the day seemed just upon us. A red streak shot up, and a rosy light seemed to diffuse itself through the room. On the instant the professor spoke again. Where are you now? The answer came dreamily, but with intention. There were as though she were interpreting something. I have heard her use the same tone when reading her shorthand notes. I do not know. It is all strange to me. What do you see? I can see nothing. It is all dark. What do you hear? I could detect the strain in the professor's patient voice. The lapping of water. It is gurgling by, and little waves leap. I can hear them on the outside. Then you are on a ship. We all looked at each other, trying to glean each, something each from the other. We were afraid to think. The answer came quick. Oh, yes. What else do you hear? The sound of men stamping overhead as they run about. There is the creaking of a chain, and the loud tinkle as the check of the capscan falls into the ratchet. What are you doing? I am still, oh, still. It is like death. The voice faded away into the deep breath as of one sleeping, and the open eyes closed again. By this time the sun had risen, and we were all in the full light of day. Dr. Van Helsing placed his hands on Mina's shoulders, and laid her head down softly on her pillow. She lay like a sleeping child for a few moments, and then, with a long sigh, awoke and stared in wonder to see us all around her. "'Have I been talking in my sleep?' was all she said. She seemed, however, to know the situation without telling, though she was eager to know what she had told. The professor repeated the conversation, and she said, "'Then there is not a moment to lose. It may not yet be too late.' Mr. Morris and Lord Godamling started for the door, but the professor's calm voice called them back. "'Stay, my friends. That ship, wherever it is, was weighing anchor at the moment in your so great port of London. Which of them is it that you seek? God be thanked that we once again have a clue, though somewhat whither that may lead us to know not. We have been blind somewhat, blind after the matter of men, since we can look back and see what we might have seen looking forward if we had been able to see what had might have seen. Alas, that sentence is a puzzle, is it not? 
We cannot know what was in the Count's mind when he seized that money, though Jonathan's so fierce knife put him in danger that even he dread. He meant escape. Hear me, escape. He saw that, but with one earth-box left and a pack of men following like dogs after a fox, this London was no place for him. He have take his last earth-box on board a ship, and he leave the land. He think to escape, but no. We follow him. Tally ho as friend Arthur would say when he put on his red frock, to our old fox is wily. Oh, so wily, and we must follow with wile. I too am wily, and I think his mind in a little while. In meantime we may rest in, in peace, for there are between us which he do not want to pass, and which he could not if he would, unless the ship were to touch the land, and then only at full or slack tide. See, and the sun is just rose, and all day to sunset it is. Let us take bath and dress and breakfast which we all need, and which we can eat comfortably since he has not been in the same land with us. Mina looked at him appealingly as she said, But why need we seek him further when he is gone from us? He took her hand and patted it as he replied, Ask me nothing yet. When we have had breakfast, then I answer all questions. He would say no more, and we separated to dress. After breakfast, Mina repeated her question. He looked at her gravely for a minute, and then said sorrowfully, "'Because, my dear, dear Madam Mina, now more than ever we must find him, even if we have to follow him to the jaws of hell.' She grew paler, as she said faintly, "'Why?' "'Because,' he answered solemnly, "'he can live for centuries, and you are but a mortal woman. Time is now to be dreaded, since once he put that mark upon your throat.' I was just in time to catch her as she fell forward in a faint. Chapter 24 Dr. Seward's Phonograph Diary Spoken by Van Helsing This to Jonathan Harker You are to stay with your dear Madam Mina. We shall go to make our search, if I can call it so, for it is not search but knowing, and we seek confirmation only. But do you stay and take care of her to-day. This is your best and most holiest office. This day nothing can find him here. Let me tell you so that you will know what we four know already, for I have tell them. He, our enemy, have gone away. He have gone back to his castle in Transylvania. I know it so well, as if a great hand of fire wrote it on the wall. He have prepared for this in some way, and that last earth box was ready to ship somewheres. For this he took the money. For this he hurry at the last, lest we catch him before the sun go down. It was his last hope, save that he might hide in the tomb that he think poor Miss Lucy, being as he thought like him, keep open to him. But there was not of time. When that fail he makes straight for his last resource, his last earthwork. I might say, did I wish double entente. He is clever, oh, so clever. He know that his game here was finish, and so he decide he go back home. He find ship going by the route he came, and he go in it. We go off now to find what ship and whither bound. When we have discovered that, we come back and tell you all. Then we will comfort you and poor Madame Mina with new hope. "'for it will be hope when you think it over "'that all is not lost. "'This very creature that we pursue, "'he take hundreds of years to get so far as London, "'and yet in one day, "'when we know of the disposal of him, "'we drive him out. "'He is finite, though he is powerful to do much harm, "'and suffers not as we do. "'But we are strong, each in our purpose, "'and we are all more strong together.' Take heart afresh, dear husband of Madame Mina. This battle is but begun, and in the end we shall win. So sure as that God sits on high to watch over his children. Therefore be of much comfort till we return. Van Helsing Jonathan Harker's Journal 4th of October when I read to Mina Van Helsing's message in the phonograph, the poor girl brightened up considerably. 
Already the certainty that the Count is out of the country has given her comfort. And comfort is strength to her. For my own part, now that his horrible danger is not face to face with us, it seems almost impossible to believe in it. Even my own terrible experiences in Castle Dracula seem like a long-forgotten dream, here in the crisp autumn air, in the bright sunlight. Alas, how can I disbelieve? In the midst of my thought my eye fell on the red scar on my poor darling's white forehead. Whilst that lasts, there can be no disbelief. Mina and I fear to be idle, so we have been over all the diaries again and again. Somehow, although the reality seem greater each time, the pain and the fear seem less. There is something of a guiding purpose manifest throughout which is comforting. Mina says that perhaps we are the instruments of ultimate good. It may be. I shall try to think as she does. We have never spoken to each other yet of the future. It is better to wait till we see the professor and the others, after their investigations. The day is running by more quickly than I ever thought a day could run for me again. It is now three o'clock. Mina Harker's Journal 5th of October, 5 p.m. Our meeting for report. Present. Professor Van Helsing, Lord Godalming, Dr. Seward, Mr. Quincy Morris, Jonathan Harker, Mina Harker. Van Helsing described what steps were taken during the day to discover on what boat and whither bound Count Dracula made his escape. As I knew that he wanted to get back to Transylvania, I felt sure that he must go by the Danube mouth, or by somewhere in the Black Sea, since by that way he come. It was a dreary blank that was before us. Omne ignotum pro magnifico, and so with heavy hearts we start to find what ships leave for the Black Sea last night. He was in sailing ship, since Madame Mina tell of sails being set. These not so important as to go in your list of the shipping in the Times, and so we go, by suggestion of Lord Godalming, to your Lloyd's, where our note of all ships that sail, however so small. There we find that only one Black Sea-bound ship go out with the tide. She is the Tsarina Catherine, and she sail from Doolittle's Wharf, for Varna, and thence to other ports and up the Danube. So, said I, this is the ship whereon is the Count. So off we go to Doolittle's Wharf, and there we find a man in an office. From him we inquire of the goings of the Tsarina Catherine. He swear much, and he red face and loud of voice, but he good fellow all the same. And when Quincy give him something from his pocket which crackle as he roll it up, and put it in a so small bag which he have hid deep in his clothing, he still better fellow and humble servant to us. He come with us, and ask many men who are rough and hot, these be better fellows, too, when they have been no more thirsty. They say much of blood and bloom, and of others which I comprehend not, though I guess what they mean. But nevertheless, they tell us all things which we want to know. They make known to us among them how last afternoon, at about five o'clock, comes a man so hurry, a tall man, thin and pale, with high nose and teeth so white, and eyes that seem to be burning. That he be all in black, except that he have a hat of straw, which suit not him, or the time. That he scatter his money in making quick inquiry as to what ship sails for the Black Sea, and for where. Some took him to the office, and then to the ship, where he will not go aboard, but halt at shore end of gangplank, and ask that the captain come to him. The captain come, when told that he will be pay well, and though he swear much, at the first he agree to term. Then the thin man go, and some one tell him where horse and cart can be hired. He go there, and soon he come again, himself driving cart, on which a great box. This, 
he himself lift down, though it take several to put it on truck for the ship. He give much talk to captain as to how and where his box is to be place. But the captain like it not, and swear at him in many tongues, and tell him that if he like he can come and see where it shall be. But he say no, that he come not yet, for that he have much to do. Whereupon the captain tell him that he had better be quick, with blood, for that his ship will leave the place, of blood, before the turn of the tide, with blood. Then the thin man smile, and say that of course he must go when he think fit, but he will be surprised if he go quite so soon. The captain swear again, polyglot, and the thin man make him bow and thank him, and say that he will so far intrude on his kindness as to come aboard before the sailing. Final, the captain, more red than ever, and in more tongues, tell him that he doesn't want no Frenchman, with bloom upon them, and also with blood, in his ship, with blood on her also. And so, after asking where he might purchase ship forms, he departed. No one knew where he went, or bloomin' well cared, as they said, for they had something else to think of, well with blood again. For it soon became apparent to all that the Tsarina Catherine would not sail as was expected. A thin mist began to creep up from the river, and it grew and grew, till soon a dense fog enveloped the ship and all around her. The captain swore polyglot, very polyglot, polyglot with bloom and blood, but he could do nothing. The water rose and rose, and he began to fear that he would lose the tide altogether. He was in no friendly mood when, just at full tide, the thin man came up the gangplank again, and asked to see where his box had been stowed. Then the captain replied that he wished he and his box, old and with much bloom and blood, were in hell. But the thin man did not be offend, and went down with the mate and saw where it was place, and came up, and stood a while on deck in fog. He must have come off by himself, for none notice him. Indeed, they thought not of him, for soon the fog began to melt away, and all was clear again. My friends of the thirst and the language that was of bloom and blood laughed, as they told how the captain's swears exceeded even his usual polyglot, and was more than ever full of picturesque, when on questioning other mariners who were on movement up and down the river that hour, he found that few of them had seen any of fog at all, except where it lay round the wharf. However, the ship went out on the ebb tide, and was doubtless by morning far down the river mouth. She was then, when they told us, well out to sea. And so, my dear Madame Mina, it is that we have to rest for a time, for our enemy is on the sea, with the fog at his command, on his way to the Danube mouth. To sail a ship takes time, go she never so quick. And when we start to go on land more quick, and we meet him there, our best hope is to come on him when in the box between sunrise and sunset, for then he can make no struggle, and we may deal with him as we should. There are days for us in which we can make ready our plan. We know all about where he go, for we have seen the owner of the ship, who have shown us invoices and all papers that can be. The box we seek is to be landed in Varna, and to be given to an agent, one Ristix, who will there present his credentials. And so our merchant friend will have done his part. When he ask if there be any wrong, for that so he can telegraph and have inquiry made at Varna, we say no, for what is to be done is not for police or of the customs. It must be done by us alone, and in our own way. When Dr. Van Helsing had done speaking, I asked him if he were certain that the Count had remained on board the ship. He replied, We have the best proof of that, your own evidence, when in the hypnotic trance this morning. I asked him again if it were really necessary that they should pursue the Count, for, oh, I dread Jonathan leaving me, and I know that he would surely go if the others went. 
he answered in growing passion, at first quietly. As he went on, however, he grew more angry and more forceful, till in the end we could not but see wherein was at least some of that personal dominance which made him so long a master amongst men. "'Yes, it is necessary, 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 for your sake in the first, and then for the sake of humanity. This monster has done much harm already, in the narrow scope where he find himself, and in the short time when as yet he was only as a body groping his so small measure in darkness, and not knowing. "'All this have I told these others. You, my dear Madam Mina, will learn it in the phonograph of my friend John, or in that of your husband. I have told them how the measure of leaving his own barren land— barren of peoples, and coming to a new land, where life of man teems till they are like the multitude of standing corn, was the work of centuries. Were another of the undead, like him, to try to do what he has done, perhaps not all the centuries of the world that have been, or that will be, could aid him. With this one all the forces of nature that are occult, and deep, and strong, must have worked together in some wondrous way. The very place where he have been alive, undead for all these centuries, is full of strangeness of the geologic and chemical world. There are deep caverns and fissures that reach none know whither. There have been volcanoes, some of whose openings still send out waters of strange properties, and gases that kill or make to vivify. Doubtless there is something magnetic or electric in some of these combinations of occult forces, which work for physical life in strange way, and in himself were from the first some great qualities. In a hard and warlike time he was celebrate that he have more iron nerve, more subtle brain, more braver heart, than any man. In him some vital principle have in strange way found their utmost— and as his body keeps strong and grow and thrive, so his brain grow too. All this without that diabolic aid, which is surely to him. For it have to yield to the powers that come from, and are symbolic of good. And now this is what he is to us. He have infect you. Oh, forgive me, my dear, that I must say such. But it is for good of you that I speak. He infect you in such wise that even if he do no more, you have only to live, to live in your own old sweet way, and so in time, death, which is of man's common lot, and with God's sanction, shall make you like to him. This must not be. We have sworn together that it must not. Thus we are ministers of God's own wish, that the world, and men for whom his son die, will not be given over to monsters whose very existence would defame him. He have allowed us to redeem one soul already, and we go out as the old knights of the cross to redeem more. Like them we shall travel towards the sunrise, and like them, if we fall, we fall in good cause. He paused, and I said, But will not the Count take his rebuff wisely? Since he has been driven from England, will he not avoid it, as a tiger does the village from which he has been hunted? Aha! he said. Your simile of the tiger good for me, and I shall adopt him. Your man-eater, as they of India call the tiger, who has once tasted blood of the human, care no more for the other prey, but prowl unceasing till he get him. This that we hunt from our village is a tiger too, a man-eater, and he never cease to prowl. Nay, in himself he is not one to retire and stay afar. In his life, his living life, he go over the turkey frontier, and attack his enemy on his own ground. He be beaten back, but did he stay? No. He come again, and again, and again. Look at his persistence and endurance." With the child-brain that was to him, he have long since conceived the idea of coming to a great city. What does he do? He find out the place of all the world most of promise for him. 
Then he deliberately set himself down to prepare for the task. He find in patience just how is his strength, and what are his powers. He study new tongues. He learn new social life, new environment of old ways, the politics, the law, the finance, the science, the habit of a new land, and a new people who have come to be since he was. His glimpse that he have had whet his appetite only, and in keen his desire, nay, it help him to grow as to his brain. For it all proved to him how right he was at the first in his surmises. He have done this alone, all alone, from a ruined tomb in a forgotten land. What more may he not do when the greater world of thought is open to him? He that can smile at death as we know him. Who can flourish in the midst of diseases that kill off whole peoples? Oh, if such an one was to come from God, and not the devil, what a force for good might he not be in this old world of ours? But we are pledged to set the world free. Our toil must be in silence, and our efforts all in secret. For in this enlightened age, when men believe not even what they see, the doubting of wise men would be his greatest strength. It would be at once his sheath and his armor, and his weapons to destroy us, his enemies, who are willing to peril even our own souls for the safety of one we love, for the good of mankind, and for the honor and glory of God. After a general discussion, it was determined that for tonight nothing be definitely settled, that we should all sleep on the facts, and try to think out the proper conclusions. Tomorrow at breakfast we are to meet again, and after making our conclusions known to one another, we shall decide on some definite cause of action. I feel a wonderful peace and rest tonight. It is as if some haunting presence were removed from me. Perhaps my surmise was not finished, could not be, for I caught sight in the mirror of the red mark upon my forehead, and I knew that I was still unclean. Dr. Seward's Diary, 5th of October. We all arose early, and I think that sleep did much for each and all of us. When we met at early breakfast, there was more general cheerfulness than any of us had ever expected to experience again. It is really wonderful how much resilience there is in human nature. Let any obstructing cause, no matter what, be removed in any way, even by death, and we fly back to first principles of hope and enjoyment. More than once, as we sat around the table, my eyes opened in wonder whether the whole of the past days had not been a dream. It was only when I caught sight of the red blotch on Mrs. Harker's forehead that I was brought back to reality. Even now, when I am gravely revolving the matter, it is almost impossible to realize that the cause of all our trouble is still existent. Even Mrs. Harker seems to lose sight of her trouble for whole spells. It is only now and again when something recalls it to her mind, that she thinks of her terrible scar. We are to meet here in my study, in half an hour, and decide on our course of action. I see only one immediate difficulty. I know it by instinct, rather than reason. We shall all have to speak frankly, and yet I fear that in some mysterious way poor Mrs. Harker's tongue is tied. I know that she forms conclusions of her own, and from all that has been I can guess how brilliant and how true they must be. But she will not, or cannot, give them utterance. I have mentioned this to Van Helsing, and he and I are to talk it over when we are alone. I suppose it is some of that horrid poison which has got into her veins beginning to work. The Count had his own purposes when he gave her what Van Helsing called the vampire's baptism of blood. Well, there may be a poison that distills itself out of good things. In an age when the existence of tomains is a mystery, we should not wonder at anything. One thing I know, that if my instinct be true regarding poor Mrs. Harker's silences, 
then there is a terrible difficulty, an unknown danger, in the work before us. The same power that compels her silence may compel her speech. I dare not think further, for so I should in my thoughts dishonour a noble woman. Later. When the professor came in, we talked over the state of things. I could see that he had something on his mind which he wanted to say, but felt some hesitancy about broaching the subject. After beating about the bush a little, he said, "'Friend John, there is something that you and I must talk of alone, just at the first, at any rate. Later we may have to take the others into our confidence.' Then he stopped, so I waited. He went on, "'Madam Mina, our poor, dear Madam Mina, is changing.' A cold shiver ran through me to find my worst fears thus endorsed. Van Helsing continued. With the sad experience of Miss Lucy, we must this time be warned before things go too far. Our task is now in reality more difficult than ever, and this new trouble makes every hour of the direst importance. I can see the characteristics of the vampire coming in her face. It is now but very, very slight. But it is to be seen, if we have eyes to notice, without prejudge. Her teeth are sharper, and at times her eyes are more hard. But these are not all. There is to her the silence now often, as so it was with Miss Lucy. She did not speak, even when she wrote that which she wished to be known later. Now my fear is this. If it be that she can, by our hypnotic trance, tell what the Count see and hear, is it not more true that he who have hypnotized her first, and who have drink of her very blood and make her drink of his, should, if he will, compel her mind to disclose to him that which she know? I nodded acquiescence. He went on. Then what we must do is to prevent this. We must keep her ignorant of our intent, and so she cannot tell what she know not. This is a painful task, oh, so painful that it heart-break me to think of it, but it must be. When to-day we meet, I must tell her that for reason which we will not to speak, she must not more be of our counsel, but be simply guarded by us. He wiped his forehead which had broken out in profuse perspiration at the thought of the pain which he might have to inflict upon the poor soul already so tortured. I knew that it would be some sort of comfort to him if I told him that I also had come to the same conclusion. For at any rate it would take away the pain of doubt. I told him, and the effect was as I expected. It is now close to the time of our general gathering— Van Helsing has gone away to prepare for the meeting, and his painful part of it. I really believe his purpose is to be able to pray alone. Later. At the very outset of our meeting, a great personal relief was experienced by both Van Helsing and myself. Mrs. Harker had sent a message by her husband to say that she would not join us at present, as she thought it better that we should be free to discuss our movements without her presence to embarrass us. The professor and I looked at each other for an instant, and somehow we both seemed relieved. For my own part, I thought that if Mrs. Harker realized the danger herself, it was much pain, as well as much danger, averted. Under the circumstances we agreed, by a questioning look and answer, with finger on lip, to preserve silence in our suspicions, until we should have been able to confer alone again. We went at once into our plan of campaign. Van Helsing roughly put the facts before us. The Tsarina Catherine left the Thames yesterday morning. It will take her at the quickest speed she has ever made, at least three weeks to reach Varna. But we can travel overland to the same place in three days. Now, if we allow for two days less for the ship's voyage, owing to such weather influences as we know that the Count can bring to bear, 
and if we allow a whole day and night for any delays which may occur to us, then we have a margin of nearly two weeks. Thus, in order to be quite safe, we must leave here on 17th at latest. Then we shall, at any rate, be in Varna a day before the ship arrives, and able to make such preparations as may be necessary. Of course, we shall all go armed, armed against evil things, spiritual as well as physical. Here Quincy Morris added, I understand that the Count comes from a wolf country, and it may be that he shall get there before us. I propose that we add Winchesters to our armament. I have a kind of belief in a Winchester when there is any trouble of that sort around. Do you remember, Art, when we had the pack after us at Tobolsk? What wouldn't we have given then for a repeater apiece? Good, said Van Helsing. Winchesters it shall be. Quincy's head is level at times, but most so when there is to hunt. Metaphor be more dishonour to science than wolves be of danger to man. In the meantime, we can do nothing here, and as I think that Varna is not familiar to any of us, why not go there more soon? It is as long to wait here as there. Tonight and tomorrow we can get ready, and then if all be well, we four can set out on our journey. We four, said Harker, interrogatively, looking from one to another of us. Of course, answered the professor quickly, you must remain to take care of your so sweet wife. Harker was silent for a while, and then said in a hollow voice, Let us talk of that part of it in the morning. I want to consult with Mina. I thought that now was the time for Van Helsing to warn him not to disclose our plan to her, but he took no notice. I looked at him significantly and coughed. For answer he put his finger to his lips and turned away. Jonathan Harker's Journal 5th of October, Afternoon For some time after our meeting this morning I could not think. The new phases of things leave my mind in a state of wonder which allows no room for active thought. Mina's determination not to take any part in the discussion set me thinking. And as I could not argue the matter with her, I could only guess. I am as far as ever from a solution now. The way the others received it, too, puzzled me. The last time we talked of the subject we agreed that there was to be no more concealment of anything amongst us. Mina is sleeping now, calmly and sweetly, like a little child. Her lips are curved, and her face beams with happiness. Thank God there are such moments still for her. Later. How strange it all is! I sat watching Mina's happy sleep, and I came as near to being happy myself as I suppose I shall ever be. As the evening drew on, and the earth took its shadows from the sun sinking lower, the silence of the room grew more and more solemn to me. All at once Mina opened her eyes, and, looking at me tenderly, said, "'Jonathan, I want you to promise me something on your word of honour, a promise made to me, but made holily in God's hearing, and not to be broken, though I should go down on my knees and implore you with bitter tears. Quick, you must make it to me at once.' "'Mina,' I said, "'a promise like that I cannot make at once. I may have no right to make it.' "'But, dear one,' she said, with such spiritual intensity that her eyes were like pole-stars, "'it is I who wish it, and it is not for myself. You can ask Dr. Van Helsing if I am not right. If he disagrees, you may do as you will. Nay, more if you all agree, later you are absolved from the promise. I promise, I said, and for a moment she looked supremely happy, though to me all happiness for her was denied by the red scar on her forehead. She said, Promise me, that you will not tell me anything of the plans formed for the campaign against the Count, 
not by word, or inference, or implication, not at any time, whilst this remains to me. And she solemnly pointed to the scar. I saw that she was in earnest, and said solemnly, I promise. And as I said it, I felt that from that instant a door had been shut between us. Later, midnight. Mina has been bright and cheerful all the evening, so much so that all the rest seem to take courage, as if infected somewhat with her gaiety. As a result, even I myself felt as if the pall of gloom which weighs us down were somewhat lifted. We all retired early. Mina is now sleeping like a little child. It is a wonderful thing that her faculty of sleep remains to her in the midst of her terrible trouble. Thank God for it, for then at least she can forget her care. Perhaps her example may affect me as her gaiety did to-night. I shall try it. Oh, for a dreamless sleep! 6th of October, morning. Another surprise. Mina woke me early, about the same time as yesterday, and asked me to bring Dr. Van Helsing. I thought that it was another occasion for hypnotism, and without question went for the professor. He had evidently expected some such call, for I found him dressed in his room. His door was ajar, so that he could hear the opening of the door of our room. He came at once. As he passed into the room, he asked Mina if the others might come, too. No, she said quite simply. It will not be necessary. You can tell them just as well. I must go with you on your journey. Dr. Van Helsing was as startled as I was. After a moment's pause, he asked, But why? You must take me with you. I am safer with you. "'and you shall be safer, too.' "'But why, dear Madame Mina? "'You know that your safety is our solemnest duty. "'We go into danger to which you are, or may be, "'more liable than any of us from, from circumstances, "'things that have been.' "'He paused, embarrassed. "'As she replied, she raised her finger "'and pointed to her forehead.' I know, that is why I must go. I can tell you now, whilst the sun is coming up, I may not be able again. I know that when the Count wills me, I must go. I know that if he tells me to come in secret, I must, by wile, by any device to hoodwink, even Jonathan. God saw the look that she turned on me as she spoke, and if there be indeed a recording angel— that look is noted to her everlasting honour. I could only clasp her hand. I could not speak. My emotion was too great for even the relief of tears. She went on. You men are brave and strong. You are strong in your numbers, for you can defy that which would break down the human endurance of one who had to guard alone. Besides, I may be of service, since you can hypnotize me, and so learn that which even I myself do not know. Dr. Van Helsing said gravely, Madam Mina, you are, as always, most wise. You shall with us come, and together we shall do that which we go forth to achieve. When he had spoken, Mina's long spell of silence made me look at her. She had fallen back on her pillow asleep. She did not even wake when I had pulled up the blind and let in the sunlight which flooded the room. Van Helsing motioned to me to come with him quietly. We went to his room, and within a minute Lord Godalming, Dr. Seward, and Mr. Morris were with us also. He told them what Mina had said, and went on. In the morning we shall leave for Varna. We have now to deal with a new factor— Madame Mina. Oh, but her soul is true. It is to her an agony to tell us so much as she has done. But it is most right, and we are warned in time. There must be no chance lost, and in Varna we must be ready to act the instant when that ship arrives. 
"'What shall we do exactly?' asked Mr. Morris, laconically. The professor paused before replying. "'We shall at the first board that ship. Then, when we have identified the box, we shall place a branch of the wild rose on it. This we shall fasten, for when it is there none can emerge. So that, at least, says the superstition.' and to superstition must we trust at the first. It was man's faith in the early, and it have its root in faith still. Then, when we get the opportunity that we seek, when none are near to see, we shall open the box, and, and all will be well. I shall not wait for any opportunity, said Morris. When I see the box, I shall open it, and destroy the monster, though there were a thousand men looking on, and if I am to be wiped out for it the next moment. I grasped his hand instinctively, and found it as firm as a piece of steel. I think he understood my look. I hope he did. "'Good boy,' said Dr. Van Helsing. "'Brave boy. Quincy is all man. God bless him for it. My child, believe me, none of us shall lag behind or pause from any fear.' I do but say what we may do, what we must do. But indeed, indeed, we cannot say what we may do. There are so many things which may happen, and their ways and their ends are so various, that until the moment we may not say. We shall all be armed in all ways, and when the time for the end has come, our effort shall not be lack. Now let us to-day put all our affairs in order, Let all things which touch on others dear to us, and who on us depend, be complete. For none of us can tell what, or when, or how the end may be. As for me, my own affairs are regulate, and as I have nothing else to do, I shall go make arrangements for the travel. I shall have all tickets and so forth for our journey. There was nothing further to be said, and we parted. I shall now settle up all my affairs of earth, and be ready for whatever may come. Later. It is done. My will is made, and all complete. Mina, if she survive, is my sole heir. If it should not be so, then the others who have been so good to us shall have remainder. It is now drawing towards the sunset. Mina's uneasiness calls my attention to it. I am sure that there is something on her mind which the time of exact sunset will reveal. These occasions are becoming harrowing times for us all, for each sunrise and sunset opens up some new danger, some new pain, which, however, may in God's will be means to a good end. I write all these things in the diary, since my darling must not hear them now. But if it may be that she can see them again, they shall be ready. She is calling to me. End of chapter 24